Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining the call to discuss the straw proposal for the market enhancements for summer 2021 readiness initiative. This is Christina Osborne with ISO Stakeholder Affairs. I'll be facilitating the web conference. Uh, James Friedrich from Market Policy and Infrastructure, excuse me, Market and Infrastructure Policy will start off by providing a brief overview um, of the background and scope for this initiative, and then he and others from the policy team, including Danny Johnson, Daniel Table, Terry Servideo, and Gabe Murtaugh, will go into the details of the proposal. Um, also from the ISO, on the panelist side, we have Greg Cook, Brad Cooper, John Gooden, John Trethaway, Brittany Dean. Jill Powers, George Angelides, James Lynn, Guillermo Batista Alderet, uh, Rahul Kalaskar, Dave Del Park, and Virginia Thompson. So this graphic uh, depicts ISO stakeholder process. Uh, we are in the straw proposal phase. I will um, go review the detailed schedule when I go over the next step at the end of the presentation. Uh, so we will stop after each of the um, proposed topics, we are going to pause for questions. Um, at that time, the event producer will instruct you on how to raise your hand to enter the queue. Uh, just please remember to state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Uh, we are recording the meeting, and we will make that video file available on the initial web page for a limited time. Um, we just ask that before reprinting any uh, related transcriptions that you do ask permission from the ISO. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to James. Thank you, Christina. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for this call. This slide here summarizes what we hope to accomplish with this initiative and reiterates that this initiative is just a subset of many concurrent actions the California ISO is taking to ensure summer readiness. Our focus is on protecting grid reliability and avoiding rotating power outages by increasing access the available supply during extreme heat waves. In addition to reliability, however, the California ISO is responsible for ensuring its markets are operated efficiently by mitigating market power and ensuring rational price formation. Next slide, please. This slide shows a list of the various topics we are considering for this initiative. The general themes have not changed since we last presented these. Although you may notice we have rebranded some of the topics, we have also since included a few additional items based on stakeholder feedback and are also considering aligning this initiative with implementation of system market power mitigation. My colleagues and I will be presenting each topic today. <clears throat> After going through all of the material on each topic, we will pause to take stakeholder questions and feedback. And I'll be going over the first topic today, which is reconsideration of our export and load priorities. We'll go to slide eight. Yep. So first, I'd like to thank everyone who participated in our January 12th workshop on export and load priorities, uh, especially to Kathy Anderson of Idaho Power, who presented on load and export priorities from the perspective of a balancing authority area operating under the OAT framework. The bullets on this slide here summarize a few lessons learned from that workshop. Of course, it's tough to synthesize a day-long workshop into three bullets, but these are some thoughts that are relevant for the rest of the discussion on this topic. We note here that although they have the ability to, it is the practice of Western BAAs not to cut generators that are contracted to support an export when there are capacity shortfalls in their BAA, but the generators can be curtailed to manage congestion. This is because there could be adverse effects in the receiving BAA, as well as the reputational risk of not honoring firm exports. However, the California ISO market does not have a process for determining excess system capacity or allocating transmission prior to accepting a transaction for an export or real self-schedule. Despite the different paradigms, we are looking to provide analogous and comparable firm and non-firm treatment to the extent possible as the rest of the West. Next slide, please. Before going into the policy proposals, it's very important that we be on the same page when it comes to the terminology, or this can get very confusing very quickly. So this slide here provides definitions for how we define various categories of exports. First, a PT export or a price taker export 
is a self-scheduled export with a designated supporting resource with sufficient non-RA generation bid in the market. That contrasts with an LTT export, which is also a self-scheduled export, but does not designate a supporting resource with sufficient non-RA generation bid in the market. An economic export is, of course, an export with supporting economic bids rather than self-schedules. And finally, what, we call, what we're going to call a REC export are the physical exports deemed feasible through the REC process and can be any of the three categories of exports above. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes our current and proposed scheduling priorities of exports relative to our load. The left-hand side shows the California ISO's current scheduling priorities. In the day-ahead market, currently PT exports share the highest priority with California ISO load, followed by LPT exports, and then by economic exports. In the real-time market, currently any export with a corresponding REC schedule, regardless of the type of export it was in the day-ahead market, gets the highest real-time scheduling priority. Following the priority of REC exports are new PT exports submitted in the real-time market with equal scheduling priority to California ISO load, and then followed by new LPT exports, and lastly, new economic bid exports. The right-hand side shows the proposed scheduling priorities. I'll just highlight the major differences and then go into detail in the following slides. First, you can see in both markets that we propose higher priority for PT exports than California ISO load rather than equal to load as it is today. We find that this is comparable to practices in BAAs across the West and gives the same treatment to our exports as we would expect, for example, from an RA import in a neighboring BAA. Since we forward contracted without supply, we would expect those imports to be delivered regardless of capacity shortfalls in the neighboring BAA. Second, you can see that we propose to maintain the September 5th change, that scheduling priorities be determined by the REC schedule and not the IFM schedule. However, and I'll talk more about this on the next slide, we propose that exports scheduled in REC need to either continue to specify or re-specify a supporting non-RA resource in their real-time bid to maintain the highest level of priority. That is what the with Gen shorthand stands for in the bottom right corner. You can also see that resources without Gen or without a supporting non-RA resource do not continue to get the highest priority as is true today. Instead, what we propose is that those exports have lower priority than our load in real time. However, those exports without supporting non-RA will receive higher priority than any new LPT export or economic export bid submitted in the real-time market. Next slide, please. This slide provides more detail on the with-gen and without-gen concepts from the last slide. I'll repeat that our current proposal is to give the highest scheduling priority to exports with a corresponding REC schedule that specifies supporting non-RA resource in their real-time market bid. Breaking that down a little, an export bid submitted as PT with a supporting resource in the day ahead market must continue to designate a supporting resource in their real-time market bid to maintain their high priority status. In addition, an LTT export or economic export bid submitted in the day ahead market and deemed feasible in REC can firm up their export schedule by also identifying a supporting resource between the day-end market and real-time market runs. On the other hand, an export bid submitted as PT with a supporting resource in the day-end market that does not designate a supporting resource in its real-time bid will have lower priority than California ISO load, but higher priority than any new LPT export. This last bullet touches on the fact that resources with day-ahead schedules that do not bid in the real-time market are assumed to be self-scheduling their day-ahead schedules. Under this proposal, <clears throat> if any export, including PT exports, from the day-ahead market does not bid, the real-time market self-schedule will be submitted as LPT. 
Again, those exports would still receive higher priority than new LPT exports or economic export bids. Next slide, please. This slide continues the discussion from the last slide. The first bullet here explains how we will, that how we will validate non-RA generation will consider changes in RA status, for example, related to CPM, or if a resource is providing substitute capacity for another resource on outage, and we'll also consider outages or derates to the non-RA resources themselves. We want to highlight that the Power Contracts Bulletin Board is an existing tool on the market participant portal where scheduling coordinators can use to find offered resource capacity. Another change we propose is to make or to add a notification in the appropriate interface to the designated resource scheduling coordinator that its resource is supporting a PT export. And finally, we propose that only internal non-RA resources are eligible to be designated to support a PT export since non-RA imports have not been awarded import capability prior to the market. Next slide. Okay. So this slide explains we are not proposing changes to the process to validate a designated resource has available non-RA generation to support a PT export. Prior to the day ahead and real-time market, we will validate the resource has sufficient non-RA generation bid into the market. We will not require the resource to self-schedule the export self-schedule quantity from REC, but any self-schedule quantity in real-time above this level will not have the highest priority. We also note that the designated resource does not need to be generating in order for the export to have PT status which means the export is not unit contingent. We just need to have sufficient non-RA capacity bidding into the market. Next slide, please. So slide 14, here we recap the current proposed scheduling priorities with the context of the past few slides. Uh, I hope that this now makes a little more sense, especially the real-time market priorities in the bottom right corner. Next slide, please. So the last slide for this topic goes over some policy for wheel-through schedules. A wheel-through transaction consists of an import bid and an export bid, which may be either in the form of a sales schedule or an economic bid or both. In the short term, we propose that wheel-through schedules are treated with equivalent priority as LPT exports when self-scheduled. Our concern is that because these wheel-throughs are not allocated import capability, they could crowd out our ability to access RA imports. This would not change the constraint we enforce to ensure wheel-through transactions are balanced. It would also not affect the current scheduling priorities of ETCs and TORs. In the long term, we can add to our policy catalog to look into a process of developing, or look into developing a process to allow a wheel-through schedule to be treated similar to a PT export by reviewing and updating our processes to validate there is sufficient non-RA import capability at, our in, at an inner tie. So that concludes the section on export and load priorities, and we can open it up for stakeholder questions and feedback. Great, thank you. Uh, so, to ask a question, you can raise your hand by pressing pound two, and if you can let me know how many are in the queue, uh, Chris, it would be great. And just a reminder to please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. All right, I do currently have 10 callers in the question queue, 11 callers in the question queue. Okay. All right, moving on to our first caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hey, James, uh, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. I'll try to make this really quick because we apparently have a lot of folks with questions. Um, just going back to slide eight, um, it seems like all of this is kind of pointed at the day ahead and intraday horizon, you know, maybe one to four hours out from the operating hour uh, as far as the trying to set a good plan in place to make sure that whatever schedules are there sort of going into HASP are going to be feasible. 
Um, but one of the things we talked about last week was um, sort of what happens in real time and how the VAs in the rest of the West manage through reliability events. And I'm just wondering if, you know, if the CAISO is doing anything under, you know, this general summer readiness effort that's looking at kind of that intra-hour management, the RC's role, and maybe comparing how uh, VAs respond to energy emergency alerts and kind of reserve sharing group considerations versus what the CAISO does uh, with self-managing reserves and having your, you know, your system emergency levels um, that you work through. Um, you know, just if any of that will kind of be in scope or if you're really just focused on kind of the uh, that period leading up to HASP. Um, and I, I ask that, too, because there's no discussion of kind of EIM transfers and sort of what happens if you get into the, the FMM RTD horizon and either because of congestion having the impact, you know, good or bad, um, that causes some, some need to uh, manage through these priority levels. So I know that's a lot of stuff. If you'd rather, you know, sort of just follow up, uh, you know, offline or something, that's fine, too. It's, it's more of a scope question. Yeah, I, this is Don. You know, we did, we did in the last time mention that we would look at our operating procedures. Um, I think our intent is that we look at the half schedules as, you know, that, the, the, the final physical uh, schedules that can be supported into real time where we would seek to honor those. Uh, we do have uh, procedures where if, if it's low priority exports, you know, that clear through the half, they could potentially be curtailed. But I think our intention is that we would try to honor the, the, the half schedules. Um, and uh, we can we can provide more uh, information on that in the as we as we sort of finalize sort of the, the the scheduling priorities in terms of what's offered into our market, and then we can talk about uh, you know what we would do after the half horizon. So we can we can provide that. Okay. Yeah, I think some, some clarifications there would be good, and I think that's in line also with uh, some of the things that are later in the presentation around the. Uh, NSI management and that sort of thing. So thanks for that. And then one other thing, maybe, Don, while your mic's on, what's the significance of having Dane noted on slide 14? We had already highlighted this as an issue in the day-ahead market enhancements. We talked about it at the last market surveillance committee meeting, where since we were procuring, export, or procuring imbalance reserves through a demand curve, you could see instances where economic exports clear by relaxing our imbalance reserve requirement, um, and we wouldn't want to uh, to do that. Um, and so by putting in these scheduling priorities, we're only in the event that you've actually contracted with non-RA capacity, that addresses the concern of clearing in the day-ahead time frame uh, the imbalance reserves through demand curve. Great, so sort of noting that this is all in alignment with where you want to go in Dane. Uh, good stuff. Well, see the time to the rest of the group. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dan. How many do we have in the queue, Chris? Currently have 12 callers in queue. Okay. We'll go to our next caller, please. All right. We'll go to our next caller. Our right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, guys. This is Mike Castellano from the CPUC. Um, I think one of our main concerns in this area is on the definition of non-RA generation. Uh, in particular, things like a 100 megawatt resource with 95 megawatts of NQC that bids 100 megawatts into the market, that extra 5 megawatts uh, has essentially been contracted and is not non-RA. And there are a lot of examples of that. I know there, there was a lot of back and forth with that over the summer when we were evaluating how much non-RA capacity there had been. So we're, we're really looking for a detailed, careful, and reasonable definition of non-RA capacity here. So if you can give that to me, that would be great. No, so Mike, I think I think what you're saying there, now I think we need to separate in terms of whether, whether someone could sell that as non-RA capacity or not from whether or not we validate that's the case. Um, so I, I, I think I would agree with you that if someone's contracting with 100 megawatts, that the uh, LSE that's contracted with them shouldn't be then going and selling the five megawatts as uncontracted supply. But I don't know how we can we can necessarily validate that prior to the market 
maybe that's just a separate rule we need to have that to the extent that uh, you know, your NQC is less than your PMAX, that that portion you're not allowed to uh, uh, sell to support a, a, a PT export. Um, and again, that's also why we uh, have the notification uh, to the scheduling coordinator of the actual resource that, so that uh, there is a conscious decision that that, that excess capacity uh, not needed for an LSC to pass to, to, to meet their RH growing is, is what's been contracted for. Okay, one thing you could do, Don, is you could look at um, saying that those exports have to be backed by uncommitted NQC. Uh, I, yeah, I think we can look into that. I agree. I, I think the key is it's very difficult to then do a validation of that. Different. I don't think we need to change our validation approach. Uh, we just need to make sure that it's not, uh, in essence, sold. Right, and that, but you know this is it's really important because this is one of the issues that we had with figuring out what happened last summer, and if we don't even if it's really hard if we don't find a way to do this right, then a lot of these changes are not meaningful. You know, if if we're accidentally letting what is essentially contracted capacity slip through to exports, then all this work on sort of reprioritizing how exports work doesn't really do anything for us, right? So just it's a, you know, this is not an implementation detail. This is a very, very important policy detail. So I, I thought I agreed with you, so <laughs> that, that okay. you would not want someone selling that, 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 that capacity. And, and again, that's why we're putting in these, that we can put in additional rules in terms of how you're allowed to transact that capacity and one could, we could put in a rule that is, as you suggested. All right, thanks, John. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to the next caller, please. All right, we'll now to our next caller in queue. Caller, your line is now unmuted. Hey, uh, this is Eric Little from Edison, and this is actually perfect timing because this follows up on, on exactly what you and Doug were just talking about. So there's there's another little piece to this that we need to consider, um, and that is what happens with uh, a, an export source from wind and solar that's RA, um, because the NQC and the offer obligation are not exactly the same thing, right? So if, if the the NQC is 100 megawatts and the EL, sorry, the, the installed capacity is 100 megawatts. The ELCC says its NQC is 25 megawatts, but the offer obligation for that resource is to schedule the forecast or bid the forecast. Uh, and if the forecast says in this particular hour there's plenty of solar irradiance and therefore I expect 100 megawatts, um, you, you wouldn't then say that 75 of that is eligible for an export because it's non-RA related. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you guys have thought through that aspect of it uh, and, and if what you're really doing is it's the, the must offer obligation that determines what is RA and what is not in that type of a case. So this is Don. I, I think that's an, an, another good clarification we could put in place uh, as, you know, to capture that, that yes, that is the, the one way that we could also approach that is whatever your must offer obligation, you cannot sell above, sell any of that must offer obligation. Okay. Thank you, Don. That helps quite a bit. Appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. I will go to the next question. All right, we'll now to our next caller. Hi, caller. Your line is now unmuted. Hi, this is Carrie Batley with the Western Power Trading Forum. I just had a quick clarifying question. Um, when you were on page 10 and you were talking about the non-RA check, I wasn't sure whether you were saying you would be doing a, a check of all non-RA or whether whether there was sufficient non-RA generation bid in to support exports overall or whether you were checking whether that specific resource had offered in. Like, what if there were some other non it's the, specific, on a it's, the specific, it's the specific resource identified on the bid. Would have to be in. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. On to the next caller, please. Hi, right, we're on to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. 
Hi, good afternoon, Don. It's it's Mark Holman with PowerX. Um, I wanted to walk through, in particular, the wheel issue. But as you know, your proposal just came out uh, yesterday, I think. As I understand it, on the internal generation, you're, you're trying to move in the direction of of respecting that if an internal generator contracts with someone outside the CAISO BAA on a forward basis for that capacity, trying to respect that. And that, that's a, a, a move in the right direction in terms of now internal generation um, has opportunities to sell RA to LSEs inside California, forward commit to load serving entities outside of California, and the market functions with the LSEs competing with the various sources of supply to achieve an efficient outcome. But I'm struggling um, quite a bit with what I see so far for the wheel concept. And in particular, probably the best example to, to talk through to be illustrative is Northwest Supply looking to sell forward to the Southwest. And the CAISO's role as a transmission service provider and its obligations to provide open access. So what I'm struggling with is Entities that have firm supply not inside California, but have RA capability in the Northwest, wanting to be able to deliver that to the Southwest and use CAISO transmission service to wheel through the CAISO to get to the Southwest. It appears that this proposal is a very significant change from what we see elsewhere and what the CAISO has historically done which it is appearing to increase the priority of load inside California when you are import constrained relative to wheel through service. And that entities are now going to be unable to sell forward from the Northwest to the Southwest and be able to compete on a level playing field for open access to the CAISO transmission system to wheel through to the southwest. And I'm wondering if you could just walk through that a little bit because I'm I'm struggling with this concept of import RA getting priority access to the transmission system as if import capability is a physical right and that when you're import constrained, you're gonna give higher priority to load inside California relative to wheel throughs that are trying to serve load in the southwest. Can we can we maybe move to that slide and walk through that a little bit? Sure. I think you've jumped to what, what, what we would want in terms of from a from whether we need what the of the item that we're looking to add to the catalog. But I'll start with initially. So we do the a maximum import capability analysis. Uh, that's a process whereby we allocate that capability to uh, load serving entities within California in order to ensure that the RA that they've contracted with, that we have the sufficient ability to sync it into the CAISO VA. If we do not have uh, uh, the, the changes we're making here on a wheel, and what, what could have happened t today is that the wheel uh, actually would have a higher priority than the CAISO uh, load ability to import that capability. Um, and so what we're saying is we're going to now, uh, to the extent that there is not no more import capability such, such that we've exhausted, we need it, we, it's, we've exhausted the, the total amount that we have from a, our, uh, from an import capability that we would serve it with RA import first. And then to the extent that anytime there is capacity, even import capability, even if the CAISO is capacity short, then you would still see that wheel clear and go through because we've, we've balanced the import and the export. Um, but to the extent that that import capability that's been allocated as part of RA is, um, is uh, um, provided, then we, we would make sure that we do that. But I, and I also would note that if someone has purchase, you know, EPCs or TORs that gives them scheduling rights that to import, that those are actually at a, at a higher priority than CAISO RA imports are. Um, so I understand. Given that, you've given that long-term 
certainty uh, to the ETCs and TORs. The question is, do you need some intermediate uh, new uh, certainty around like a monthly process or something where you can then uh, basically get import capability so that that wheel can be treated as a, as a uh, higher priority than uh, uh, or, or equal priority to types of imports. Yeah, Don, and I, and I appreciate where you're trying to go with the internal generation, and I appreciate the explanation, but I, I think there's a significant gap here, and I also appreciate the, the policy catalog item, but, but I think there's a real challenge here is that import capability, as I understand it, is a mechanism to ensure that import RA into the CAISO does not exceed the import transfer capability of an inner tie. It's not intended to be a physical transmission right. It's not intended to determine who receives priority rights to flow on the transmission system between imports and wheel through. And critically important, it is not dispersed or allocated through an open access framework. Load serving entities in California in the CAISO BAA have priority access to that. And so it, you, you don't have an open access framework for allocating import capability. That's not what its purpose was, as I understand it. Its purpose was to make sure import RA contracts collectively don't exceed the import capability of the inner tie, and that makes sense to me. But it seems like it's now being transformed into a physical right that now if you have both import RA supply and wheel throughs both wanting to use the import space of the CAISO transmission grid in the operational time frame of day ahead in real time, the load, load serving entities inside the CAISO BAA are getting priority access. And so that when there's a constraint in the import direction, the CAISO's load serving entities are getting preferential access to the CAISO transmission system because this import capability right that is not distributed through open access has been transformed into a physical right. And so while I appreciate the, the catalog approach, this is gonna mean that entities that have physical supply in the Northwest who wanna make forward sales to the Southwest are gonna be subordinated to load serving entities who buy supply in the Northwest. And effectively the Southwest load gets subordinated to the CAISO load in accessing Northwest supply to meet their reliability needs. From a Northwest perspective, there's the, the only way you can be assured of getting a sale is to a California ISO LSC because they now have priority rights to the import space. So I think this is a real problem from an open access perspective that when you're import constrained and until the time you have a forward physical open access framework that all entities can compete for priority access to using the transmission grid, it is problematic on an interim basis to give CAISO load priority to Northwest supply over Southwest loads when you're import constrained. I, I think that is transforming what import capability is. I think it's inconsistent with open access. And I think it elevates the CAISO load serving entities access to the CAISO transmission system without going through an open access framework. Thank you for your comments, um, Mark, appreciate it. So we'll go to the next caller, please. How many do we have in the queue, Chris? I have six in the, in the queue. Six, okay, thanks. All right, we'll wrap the next caller. Caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, um, it's Lindsay Schluckway from Pacificorp. I'm hoping you can explain something to me on um, page 13. Yes. So I don't understand that last bullet um, where resources do not need to be um, generating in order to in order to have the PT status. Because from what I understood with your definition, is that um, PT status was um, one in which. Um, a specific resource had to be designated. So could you explain that a little bit further? So this is on. So we do see benefits to continuing to allow economic participation of the 
individual resources within our balancing authority area. And so the fact that uh, uh, if, as long as that resource is offering and there, there, there are insufficient bids to meet uh, uh, you know, load, then you have this resource available to support the export. But to the extent that we can get a more optimal schedule by not scheduling that resource and scheduling a, a lower cost resource, even if it's RA, um, then that's the correct market solution. And the fact that uh, the, the, the high, you get the high priority export um, just simply by having capacity available into the market, and then if the market determines it needs it, it can schedule it. But if it determines it doesn't need it, we don't need need it in order to give that high priority because they've already met their offer obligation. Okay. I, that explanation actually explains um, your thought process a lot more. So thank you very much. All right. We have five left in the queue. Chris, we'll go to the next caller, please. All right. We're on to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. This is Dave Francis, DTE Energy. Um, Early on, a comment was made, um, slide five, six, or seven, I believe, about um, Kaiser. And if I butchered this way, statement was made. The phrase was called forward contracting. Was that in terms of RA capacity, in terms of energy from RA? Do you remember what you were thought it, thinking then? I think when we use the term forward contracting, we're talking about that they have secured the capacity. Uh, necessary to then have that be firm energy to the extent that it's scheduled. And when you say scheduled, do you mean that it would be awarded based on its bid, whether or not it was economic in the model? Well, okay, so I think you're, you're getting into uh, uh, how you can firm up your uh, uh, your schedule. And so we're, we're, we're saying that to the extent that you can contract with non-RA capacity, that's how you can get firm energy out of the KISA. And you just have okay, to I didn't think, I, Yeah, I didn't think the phrase for contract was meant for an export. I thought it was in terms of KISO or load relative to, uh, I thought, import RA. Maybe I misheard it. Our expectation is that if uh, anyone who's forward contracted with the capacity should have the, 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 the right to that energy. And if you haven't forward contracted with it, then you're basically doing economy energy. But you, so you're, are you, are you, that makes me think of uh, PowerX's question, that the contract for the capacity also includes rights to the transmission? That's where we're, where we're a little different than the bilateral world, where you basically secure both of those, the capacity and the transmission, simultaneously. Uh, you know, no one would, no, no BAA outside of KISA would accept an, uh, an export schedule or a wheel-through schedule that limited their ability to import RA, their RA that they needed to do it. But they have the ability to make that determination at the same time. Our market's a little different in terms of that we do uh, sort of the, the, the clearing of the bids um, and the congestion manage that through the market, and it's after the market that we basically firmed up the transmission associated with the energy schedules. Right. So all the capacity does is, back to Pyrex's observation, it keeps the intertype from being overloaded. Then the energy is cleared based on price, not on its other status. I didn't quite follow that, so if you want to restate it, I can respond. Yeah, so if there's a stack of supply at an inner tie that's mingled RA and non-RA, what clears is based on pots, not based on RA or non-RA status, correct? Oh, that's correct. Right. And what we're really talking about here, when we talk about these scheduling priorities, are, are people coming in not doing economic offers, but rather saying, I'm going to flow unless you tell me I can't. And so what we're doing is updating these scheduling priorities to tell people when they can't flow. I know you want to, but since you haven't uh, forward contracted with any supply 
in the KAISO that from non-RA resources, we're not going to let that, that, that we're not going to basically accept that self-schedule. After we can all the economic even if that self-schedule implies a higher value than any other bid? To the extent that it uses RA capacity that we that we uh, need, we would not want to uh, award that schedule. So if the marginal bid for load was 100 bucks and the self-scheduled export is implied at 1450 you would hold the capacity for the lower bid? Again, we're using the rough process to determine what's physically capable uh, from a, a, a day ahead time frame. That's because in the, for exactly the reason you have there, is that there's bid and load as well as virtual supply in the integrated forward market. Um, okay, fine. Take the, take the convergence out. Suspend the convergence bids. And all you have is load and from exports. There's plenty to go around and the export self scheduled and therefore it's an implied higher price than load. You curtail the load to serve the, you curtail the export to serve the load. The rough schedule, which is meeting the KISO load forecast, uh, is, needs that RA capacity to meet the load forecast, which is the purpose of RA. So as a, as a related question, where do I find the calculation? I think in this presentation you guys use rough export. I think it's also referred to kind of as rough schedules that it's given for exports to be able to tag to. Where do I find the calculation of how that's made? That's through our rough scheduling priorities uh, that are outlined in our BPM in terms of how we bring those ISM schedules in and at what what priority level they're used when we clear the residual unit commitment process. Especially in the case where you can finish. This is this is Brad Cooper and 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 uh, Dave. Maybe we can follow up offline because we've got a lot of material to get through. We've got a bunch of other topics, but, but the, the, the RUC schedules, it's not a simple calculation. It's the result of the, of the RUC optimization. That, that, that produces the RUC schedules based on, based on uh, our load forecast. Well, Brad, if you'll come in, and the I've been told, to, understood, I've been told to ask these questions here. If you'll come in to get me answers, I'll be glad to ask them offline. Uh, yeah, sure. Send, it, send an email and we, we can get you answers. And then just one quick follow-up. Just on the bulletin board, that's fully voluntary, right? Your KISO is not going to populate uncommitted or uncommitted capacity. It's up to the, uh, the scheduling coordinators. I just want to make sure I understand if that's active or passive on KISO's part. I'm okay with either. I just want to make sure what it is. Yeah, we will not, we will not put anything on that bulletin board. The okay. Uh, okay. Good. So it may be the same blank, and that's not your fault, but it may be the same blank space it has been for 10 years. So. Okay. Brad, I'll exactly. follow up with you guys, and I'll, I'll pass the course. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. So it looks like we have four sure. more in the queue. Is that correct, Chris? That is correct. Okay. I will now to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. All right, caller, please use your device. Hi. Yeah, hi, it's Mary Lynch with Constellation, and my question's been asked and answered, so I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. All right, we're on to our next caller in queue. All right, caller, your line's now unmuted. Yeah, thanks for the discussion. This is uh, Partha Malvacar with uh, PG&E. Um, I had a couple of follow-ups to the discussion you were having earlier, with uh, particularly with uh, Eric Little from SCE. Um, it seems like part, part of what the um, the question being asked is trying to figure out what resources are really, what resources and what uh, capacity is really non-RA and available to be uh, exported with PT priority from the KISO. Um, so I think it would be helpful if, if the KISO could provide any sort of more transparency in terms of what might be out there and available in their minds. And so a couple of examples that were brought up by uh, SCE and by the CTUC were on certain resources that were either use limited resources and or had some sort of ELCC reflecting expected um, expected output in their capacity calculation. So it would be good to 
to maybe go through those type of resources and try to understand examples in terms of what capacity would or would not be available. Um, I thought that uh, Eric's suggestion on um, certainly not allowing uh, any uh, exports up to the new value, that might be sort of one way to, to help fix the, that issue. Um, the second, uh, the second uh, question I had around that was, um, have you all looked at all in terms of the, at least one other type of resources I imagine might be available as non-RA? Uh, could be generation that does not have uh, full network deliverability status. Um, it might be sort of, for lack of our term, in some sort of generation pocket. And so I was wondering if the Kaiser would look at um, whether or not those type of resources should be eligible to be pointed at for high priority uh, export status to the degree that they could, in effect, crowd out and replace RA resources um, for being able to serve load w within California. So that's my, my first question. Um, I, I think uh, I like the second suggestion, you know, because when we do our validation, we don't, uh, you know, you know, we, we, it's after the market that we've done all our congestion management. So I think to the extent that if someone was an energy only resource in Kaiso, would you say that they don't, since they don't have, you know, high degree of deliverability, um, that uh, you know you may potentially make them ineligible from uh, uh, being able to do that. So I think we can look at, at, at uh, additional rules around around that. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Really, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, the second question, this might be sort of touching on before, you had you indicated before a change in the priority level in terms of where um, PT exports would be relative to load, and I think what was indicated in the discussion was um, it was how Kaiser would expect other BAs to provide that certainty of export priorities. Um, I. I support that concept. I mean, to me, I think that the CAISO is right on there. My own take is that what the CAISO will be proposing to do here is my interpretation is embed that within their tariff. They will be providing that certainty as a part of this um, FERC process. And I was just going to ask the CAISO is, have they reached out to other BAAs to provide sort of similar certainty in their tariffs in terms of how um, exports will be prioritized relative to load? Um, we have not discussed that make other other people would make tariff changes to to uh, uh, cement that principle, but I think at the workshop we heard pretty loud and clear that that is the standard operating procedure in the West. Um, so even if it's not in the specific oat tariffs, um, I think we will get the same uh, same treatment for to the extent that we've contracted with specific uh, supply in a VA. No, that, that makes sense, Don. And at least my, uh, my slight pushback would be, obviously, we haven't really, we haven't seen in the last two decades um, prior to last August events where we had uh, rolling blackouts throughout the West. And so how and what the practices might look like um, in those type of situations, I think that that's really critical to actually get that, um, to get that clear between the neighboring BAAs. And I think I'd have some concern with the ISO. It'd be one thing if it was sort of a, here's our here's our practice, but another thing to sort of cement that with as sort of a provision in the tariff that wasn't necessarily included in uh, other BAA. So, but yeah, thanks again for the discussion here. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I really appreciate as well the um, discussion around how we're gonna get certainty in terms of what's the RA versus non-RA for the export priority. So um, look forward to, more discussion on how we can get more clarity in terms of what those what those resources really are, what what's actually available out there that should be prioritized at that uh, PT level. So, yeah, thanks again. Right, thank you. I, I know we do have a couple of other uh, people in the queue, but we do have a lot to cover, so we'll we'll keep going um, with this topic, and then um, hopefully at the end we we can open it up for any outstanding questions that you have. So. Uh, Danny, you on the line? Yeah, sure. Okay. So this next topic is on the EIM coordination and the resource efficiency evaluation. Coming out of last summer, the ISO reviewed the performance of the resource efficiency evaluation 
and determined that modifications were appropriate. We had a workshop on this about two weeks ago. In that workshop, we identified two defects. Uh, one was to account for resource D rates within the capacity test. The second was to eliminate the double counting of MARA resources. We would plan to address both of these defects prior to summer 2021, as was discussed in that workshop. We have a couple of additional proposed improvements to the RSE capacity test, which we think are implementable by summer 2021. However, more comprehensive changes to the RSE aren't going to be feasible by summer 2021, and they in fact require changes to the current policy roadmap and our prioritization of current stakeholder initiatives. So can you go to the next slide? The additional proposed improvements to the RSC capacity test for this upcoming summer that we think are implementable are to add the uncertainty requirements that are currently in the flex ramp test to the capacity test. These uncertainty requirements would be the flexible ramping requirement for the DAA, less the diversity benefit, I'd like to add that ancillary services are already accounted for at the resource level in the capacity, counted towards this capacity test. So this would be one additional thing we think we can implement. The second would be to assess if there are any modifications that would allow the actual capacity in the test to better reflect what's available. I think the most straightforward example I can give for this is if there's a resource with bidding capacity that is offline and its startup time is greater than the one hour horizon which the RSC looks at, that would be inappropriate to consider in the capacity test. We would stop short of considering adding any intertemporal constraints simply because they're not gonna be feasible by 2021. I think during the workshop, Rahul did a really good job of highlighting how complex the flex ramp test is, and a lot of those complex and complexities are due to the intertemporal constraints that are within that test. That's something that can be addressed eventually, but by summer 2021 is not feasible. So next slide. Uh, the more comprehensive changes to the RSC are simply going to be a longer term process than what's capable in this initiative. Uh, we got feedback from PowerX in their presentation during the workshop and the stakeholder comments that this may be something that is worth investigation, but these changes really touch upon foundational elements of the EIM, and we don't think it's appropriate to try to rush these in by summer 2021. It really gets into what is the EIM participant agreement on what the definition of leaning is. It seems like there is some difference in what people view as leaning and acceptable leaning, what should be the repercussions of failure, uh, both economic repercussions or potentially even some things believe in the reliability of repercussions, and then what is the correct balance between leaning and its economic or reliability repercussions and the economic benefit that participants derive from participating in the AM. All these things are very nuanced, complicated topics, which are, we're not going to be able to resolve in the next six weeks before we have to start processing this stuff to get it in for summer 2021. I, all that being said, I would like to note that the RSC tests that do limit the amount of EIM transfers are applied equally to all EIM participants. The balancing and feasibility test, the results of those will not limit an EIM as the feasibility to access incremental transfers. The next point is that the resource efficiency evaluation is currently being discussed as bucket one within the EDEM initiative. That's been going on for around a year now, and I think that really highlights how complicated and nuanced this issue is, which gets back to this just not being something that we think we're gonna be able to address in a manner that all of our stakeholders are comfortable with prior to summer of 2021. Uh, we are open to addressing this in a separate resource efficiency evaluation initiative. However, this would require reprioritizing our existing initiatives. So that would be something that we look for in comments to this about how high of a priority this is for our EIM participants. Uh, next slide. 
So this final slide addresses the September 6th issues. Uh, we think that the resolution of these issues should improve the coordination between the EA and balancing authority areas during tight system conditions. The first of these issues is the ability or is the repercussion of running out of uh, advisory transfers if the contingency flag is enabled in an EIM area for too long. So we have a fix which will preserve the last advisory RTE interval and we'll use that should the contingency flag be flagged beyond 30 minutes. The second issue is mirror resource schedules getting cut without adjustment to the underlying interchange schedules. The first fix is to ensure auto mirroring is implemented on all mirrors. Uh, the concept of mirrors existed before the auto mirroring functionality existed, so it's just aligning the two and make sure that auto mirroring is there for all mirrors. The second fix would be to fix base intertie schedules and base ETSRs for EIM entities such that they are not subject to economic adjustment by the EIM optimization. This applies to EIM entity imports and exports with other EIM entities and non-EIM entities. This gets back to the interplay between some of the penalty parameters we have and constraint relaxation for the KISO power balance and then the export and import priorities for EIM BAAs. This fix ensures that EIM entities schedules and base ETSRs will not be adjusted to satisfy constraints which aren't uh, related to them. So that's what I have for the RSC. I'd like to open it up to questions. Great, thank you. So Chris, how many do we have in the queue so far? Can I have four callers in the queue. Okay, and just as a reminder, you can raise your hand by pressing pound two. So we'll take the first caller, please. All right, we'll answer our first caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, Danny. This is Jeff Spires with PowerX. Uh, I just wanted to give you a couple of comments on, on the resource efficiency issue. Uh, I think, first of all, just, I just want to say we're, we're really disappointed in the CAISO's response here. Uh, we presented at the workshop. There were written comments submitted on this issue afterwards. And I think it's clear that there are fundamental issues with the EIM resource sufficiency test. There have been fundamental issues with the resource sufficiency test for quite some time. These are a combination of significant inaccuracies in the supply that's getting included in the test and other design flaws that are leading to outcomes that are not at all consistent with the principle of resource sufficiency, in particular, as I outlined in the workshop, as it relates to the CAISO BA. And as I mentioned during that time and, and showed with the data, there are two outcomes that we saw during the heat wave. One is the CAISO BA passing resource sufficiency, even when it's in the midst of an emergency situation repeatedly. And second of all, the leaning on the EIM for upwards of 2,000 megawatts throughout those periods. And, you know, you refer to this as being foundational to the EIM. I agree with that. And the issue here is that these results are completely inconsistent with the principle of having a well-functioning EIM resource sufficiency test. And while I can appreciate that we need to spend the time to figure out what the solutions are. I think the answer here was fairly simple. What we were hoping to see from the CAISO here was a response that said, yes, we recognize the issue. We understand the magnitude of these challenges and, and the significant consequences of having uh, a resource efficiency test that isn't being equitably applied, and we're committed to fixing it. And I think that that was the answer we were looking for. I don't see that response. Unfortunately, I feel as though we're kicking the can down the road again, and I don't really know where we go from here, but it sounds like what we're going to end up with is another summer with a resource sufficiency test that doesn't work, 
and with the potential for leaning for thousands of megawatts by the Kaiso BA. And in our view, that just isn't acceptable. And so, I, you know, I, I guess my question is where do we go from here? Because a lot of these issues we've raised in the past, I think, like I said, the, the solutions are clear and we're looking for the commitment to get it fixed now. So, Jeff, uh, this is Danny again. I don't think we're necessarily disagreeing with you that the resource efficiency evaluation needs additional discussion. I, I would point out that the current framework that is implemented was agreed upon by, by the EIM governing body and all EIM parties. I think we're open to trying to uh, resolve this issue if, uh, if parties are still unhappy, but what we're just saying is we don't think we're going to be resolved, able to resolve this by this summer due to the complication of these issues. Well, I just, I'll have to respectfully disagree with that perspective. I think what we were looking for was to get the time with KISO staff, additional workshops to be able to address some of these issues. I think they're not that complicated. I mean, we're really saying we need a straightforward assessment that's accurate of do you have enough resources or not to meet your load and other obligations. And, and I would say, it's not, just, it's not. That gets back to what is, I think that gets back to what is the purpose of the RSC? Like is the purpose of the RSC to ensure that all EIM, BAA, IRPs and the KISO RA program is sufficient or is it to ensure that people are bringing enough to the table to gain benefit in the EIM? And I think that this is, a, it really is a nuanced discussion. And I, again, we're open to more workshops if, Stakeholders feel that this is an issue that is a really high priority. So I think in our presentation we pointed out that we are open to a separate initiative to address this issue. But the idea that we're going to resolve it in the next few weeks to then implement system changes to be ready for summer 2021 is just not feasible. Yeah, and, and, hey Jeff, this is Brad Cooper. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at our, our slide. Um, 16, and, and uh, I think maybe we came across as um, as uh, minimizing the issues, and we, we didn't we didn't mean it that way. You know, we, we did make the point that a separate resource sufficiency evaluation would re require reprioritizing existing initiatives. Um, we do mean that because that is that is that is true, and 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 and. Uh, you know, if, if stakeholders feel it's appropriate to relook at the resource efficiency evaluation for more comprehensive changes, we'll certainly consider that. And, and uh, you know, like we we had a, a lot of discussions about uh, you know your suggestion to allow transfers at the two thousand dollar penalty price, and we think that's an idea worth considering. But you know, there's there's uh, a lot to think about related to that idea. You know, we, we talked about at, uh, with, I think it was with the MSC a number of years ago about rather than freezing transfers, allowing them at some kind of, uh, 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 applying some kind of penalty, you know, and we, we've talked about this issue and it, it gets back down to kind of fundamentals of the EIM and we just don't think that the, those are realistic in time for this summer and we're trying to, be realistic in what we're biting off here. You know, honestly, you know, if you go through our entire presentation, we're going to be hard pressed to uh, get implemented what we what we what we are proposing. Thanks, Brad and Danny. Um, we proposed some potential solutions, but I think you know to back it up a level here. What I'm struggling with is even before we get to those solutions, what I'm not seeing or is not clear to me is that there's the recognition of the issue here. And I'm hearing words like it's nuanced what it means to, to meet resource sufficiency, and I feel like that's obfuscating the issue. The issue, the, the resource sufficiency test is pretty clear. Heading into the hour, do you have enough supply or not? That's the question that each BA needs to be able to answer. 
And the challenge we're struggling with here is that there is one BA that's not meeting that test and is leaning on the other entities in the EIM for very significant quantities. And so while I recognize there needs to be prioritization of different initiatives in advance of the summer, I, I you know, just back to what I said before, this is a, a big issue and I think what we, we need first and foremost is the recognition of that issue and the challenges it creates when you don't have an equitable test that is applied in the same way to all of the participants. And we need to start there. So I'll just leave it at that. But that, that's our reaction to this. And I, I just want to provide that feedback because we're really struggling with, with where do we go from here. So Jeff, thank you for your comment. I, I would like to point out that in addition to the KISO this summer uh, failing the capacity test, we are not the, or the KISO is not the only BAA that failed this test, uh, either this summer or previously. So I agree these are, this is a bigger issue that is something we need, that is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, you're right that the capacity test should reflect that people bring sufficient capacity to the market. The nuance is if they don't, what should be, like what are the appropriate repercussions? Are there financial penalties? Are there economic penalties? How do you balance those and not impact people's reliability? And that's what we want to discuss going forward to try to find that balance. Okay, Chris, how many others do we so, have with you? Oh. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Sure. So I currently have five more callers in queue. Okay, let's go to the next caller, please. All right, we're going to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, it's Mary Lynch with Constellation. Just a quick question on slides 14 and 15. I just want to clarify that the changes that you are proposing for this summer are changes that all the EIM entities would have to make, right? It's not just focused on the Cal ISO, it's on, on all EIM entities. So slide 14 and 15 associated with the export and, uh, and wheel scheduling priority, that, that's just- Oh, I'm, you know what? I think my numbering is different. I'm looking at it offline. Um, the first two slides of this section. Uh, yes, yes, these would be yeah. changes that would be applied throughout the EIM to all EIM BAAs okay. under that same concept okay. of we all should have the same test. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to, to make sure of that. Thank you. Okay, next question, Chris. All right, moving on to our next caller. All right, caller, you're on unmuted. Hi, uh, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Uh, Danny, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, thanks for going through this. I I actually jumped in the queue to ask some clarifying questions, but I um, I thought just based on your discussion earlier, I would throw out that while, like, I agree all these questions have merit, um, and I'm, encouraged, you know, encourage the guys to encourage everyone to participate, you know, to engage in them and appreciate the power to raise them. Um, but I'm even struggling with the what I think is complex enough about the proposal you have. I even put forward, I think, on, and to, I agree with Mary, it's slide 15 online, but it's the um, one that describes adding the flexible ramping requirement to the capacity test. And I think you said it so beautifully, so can I just quote you? <laughs> What's the purpose of the research sufficiency evaluation? What that is, is is exactly why I jumped in a queue. I I had quest, you know I had questions about okay well are you saying that you're talking you're going to combine the capacity test with the flex flex ramp test? I don't think it's a complete uh, combination, Kathleen. I think it would be adding elements that are currently in the flex ramp test to the okay. capacity test to better. Uh, to, and to make the concept capacity test a little more stringent. Sure, John. So this is Don. Yeah. So, you know, what we talked about in the workshop was, uh, the, you know, the capacity test was just looking at whether you have sufficient bids to meet your load. And there was concerns that the, and the flexible ramping test 
just assumes whether or not you can move from one point to another point. Do you, you, you have the ability to, have, to, to, to sort of move a certain amount? And by not having the uncertainty in the capacity test, you could theoretically, um, you know, there could be no movement, and so you would pass the flex, but you didn't have enough capacity to cover your uncertainty from, from not from a movement standpoint, but from an actual megawatt standpoint. And so I think what we've done is by recognizing now that we want to add to the capacity test the uncertainty associated with the load forecast that we are now uh, capturing the total amount of capacity that's needed uh, in the capacity test itself. Um, thanks, Don. I appreciate that. And I, and I appreciate the distinction, but I mean, that's exact, thank you for kind of describing the two tests. Again, just in case there are people on this call that weren't on the workshop. Um, but I want to reemphasize that what I, I think what I'm trying to add to the discussion is I think that this is even complex, right? What's the perfect, like, for me to be able to evaluate the merits of the proposal, I need to explore what is the underlying reason the two tests are separate today. There are fundamental differences between the tests. And I'll give one example. A question that I have is, okay, Flex Ramp has a minimum flexible ramping requirement within the EIM entity areas. If, if, and I, I need to look into the, the belly of that beast to figure out, well, is that due to uncertainty part that's in Flex Ramp? Is it the reason that that's needed? Or is it due to something else? Which I am open to doing and happy to do. I just want to give this as a, a very concrete example of even what you have included, I actually think is, is more complicated than um, that we may have time for in this initiative. Um, one of the, so, you know, I just would kind of encourage, and the other um, thing that, you know, since we're talking about what we're struggling with, I've heard a couple of people use that phrasing, I'm struggling with is to see how without the types of changes that you have proposed, you know, to add in that uncertainty, um, how without those changes that TISO operations ability to support reliability this summer would actually be undermined. And I think if you keep this element in the proposal, I would just make a request to the TISO to make it, um, provide some supporting analysis and explanation in your written um, paper on and present a later meeting why without doing this, um, reliability would be undermined, that would help me get more comfortable with it being in this expedited pro process. Otherwise, you know, my, my gut sense is, okay, let's take a holistic review of the the, um, the test within EIM and see if they should be combined, see if there should be a minimum requirement, um, even with the capacity test. Let's, you know, it's fine, let's look into the, let's look into that, but um, I would support that being in a more robust stakeholder process with more time allowed to look into the details of that. I would also make a, I'll highlight for stakeholders um, that we did, this for made a suggestion, at least for the piece of PowerX's proposal that maybe isn't necessarily about tweaking these tests, which I see as being more EIM relevant. And so, Kaisa, your suggestion to consider if you wanted to do another resource sufficiency evaluation initiative makes sense, but the element of PowerX's proposal that really struck me as almost akin to a scarcity pricing proposal, I thought may have merit in including that in an already scheduled project on, in the scarcity pricing enhancement project. Um, it could make some sense and have some benefit to think about that project holistically um, across the entire EAM. So um, I think that is just, a, I hope, a helpful suggestion that at least maybe an element may have a place already in kind of more than year term on the schedule without having to worry about reprioritizing. All right, well, thank you, Kathleen. I think on the on the nuances of how the adding the uncertainty to the capacity test would, would uh, like how that plays out, I, I think we can have that discussion offline to, to get on the same page about that. But I would ask that all stakeholders, please, like if, if you feel that this is too big of a step to even take in this initiative, please voice your concerns for consideration when we review the comments on this item. So I think, thank you, Kathleen, and do we have any other questions, Christina? Yeah, we, we have four more in the queue. 
We'll go to the next caller, please. All right, we're not to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, it's Eric Little from Edison. Um, I think I support the notion that we need to have a deeper discussion on this before we take drastic measures, and, and my rationale behind it is as follows, and, and if, if people think I'm wrong on this, then, then fine, we, we need to have a discussion about it uh, to understand it. This sufficiency test, in my recollection when we developed this in a policy sense, was in recognition of the fact that people do reliability in different manners, and we've had this discussion here in this process as well. The ISO in California has an RA program, and the way that you realize that energy is to make sure that that resource has an offer obligation into the market. And that offer obligation extends all the way through real time, which is the EIM market. So it is possible that California will be buying capacity that is then available for energy in the system, and it's possible that an outside balancing authority could be short and come in and procure that energy, even though uh, customers in California have already procured that capacity and made it available. In other areas, they have an IRP and they don't make the resource available until they know that they have things taken care of. Um, so I'm starting to question whether or not the sufficiency test is actually legitimate in general, but specifically in this case. Because when we look at the events that were happening in August and September, we were beyond the conditions that people typically plan for. We were in emergency conditions. And uh, as far as I know, it, from what I saw of the, of the report, um, the RA fleet was being provided. Yeah, there's stuff on outage, there's those types of things that happen, but the resource adequacy resources were provided. If we're then going to end up in an emergency and say that a balancing authority area that's in an emergency can't use a market to be able to get energy that it needs, then I don't know that we're really helping out with the problem of being in an emergency. So I'm, I'm supportive of having a discussion about what is the typical situation that this sufficiency test is designed to ensure, what are the differences between the, the ways the different balancing authorities assure that sufficiency, and what happens in the case where we get into an emergency circumstance that is beyond what anybody had planned for to begin with. So I think that we need to answer those questions before we can really come to a conclusion about how to how to rectify what, what has happened here and what needs to be done in terms of rule space. So I am supportive of keeping this minimal for now and having a more thorough discussion on what this program is really supposed to accomplish before we make dramatic changes. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. I, I think we would agree with that and appreciate your support. All right, so uh, we'll, go ahead. We'll, take, we'll, yeah. Yeah, we'll take two more questions and then we'll, we'll have to move on because we, um, we still have a lot to go through. So we'll go to the next caller, please. All right, we're on to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hello, this is Frank Tillett with Bonneville Power Administration. And I just wanted to j jump back to that slide 18, the proposal to add uncertain requirements to the capacity test. I um, Just to chime in on that a little bit, I, I don't want that discussion to be offline. I'd like to see a full proposal of that as long as well as some analysis. I'd like to understand what's going to happen to the current uncertainty that's included in that test if it's proposed to keep it and add additional or what the interplay is there. So I don't see it as just a simple issue and it's not definitely not something that we should just brush over, um, especially as Bono was looking to uh, looking forward into joining um, or possibly joining the, the, the EIM. So I need, would like to understand. So I don't think we're, more. this is on, yeah, this is on. I don't think we're trying to brush over it. We were just trying to highlight that what we're looking to do in the capacity test is to add that uncertainty megawatt quantity, uh, less the diversity benefit. Um, and I know in your guys' comments, you also highlighted that the current histogram approach for the uh, uh, coming up with that uncertainty requirement. Uh, on an hourly basis, you know, uses historical, not not doesn't scale based upon the amount of load, wind, and solar on the system, um, and we acknowledge that. And so, as part of the flexible ramping product refinement initiative, for, that's going in uh, after summer, uh, you know, it's going in our fall release, is where we do make the change in terms of how we calculate that uncertainty requirement. So, in terms of the accuracy of the uncertainty requirement. I think we're addressing that through the FRP refinements initiative in the fall release. What we're looking to do here 
is to address the narrow issues where by not including that capacity test, there could be instances where the flex ramp test, uh, which does include that, the, the, the capacity, it, the, the uncertainty, but it's not including the uncertainty megawatts. It's including the uncertainty in terms of the amount of movement between two points. And so this ensures that we've now are testing on a megawatt quantity as well in the capacity test, the uncertainty associated with the load forecast. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to see, a, 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 I mean, and I haven't had a chance to look at the straw proposal to see if it, it lays things out further, but, uh, you know, some equations and whatnot that are associated with the proposal. Um, on that same manner, I, I, is there plans at some point to do an update on that fall rollout of the improvement on the uncertainty requirement? Because it's been a couple of years from what I can see since it's been discussed. From what I've been We're in the process of, at least. of designing it and implementing it now. So um, there's not additional discussion that's going on on that. Okay, is there a place where you can find framework on that, um, on, what, on what's being implemented? Yes, you can look at the uh, flexible ramping product refinements, and you can also look at the day ahead market enhancements. In both instances, I think we've talked through the quantile regression approach that we're developing. Okay, so thank you. It's the same one that was last discussed in 2018, I believe, 2019. Okay, thank you, that is all. all right, thank you, so we'll take one more question and then we'll go ahead and move to the next topic, so. Chris? All right, one of our last caller in queue. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, this is Laura Trelease from the Bonville Power Administration, and I, I see two issues here with the resource efficiency test from this past summer but I just don't want to get lost in the mix. I appreciate the conversation with Jeff earlier about when the CAISO failed the test, but I think even to take a step backwards, the first issue is when CAISO passed the test, but they were in an air energy emergency alert stage two and three. And I went back and looked at the CAISO white paper that CAISO put out back in September 19 of 2018 and CAISO had stated in there, the purpose of the resource efficiency evaluation is to ensure that each EI amenity can adequately balance their own supply and demand prior to participating in the EIM. And then it talks about no leaning. When I look at the NERC definitions of an energy emergency alert, energy emergency alert one is that all available generation resources are in use. Energy Emergency Alert 2, the BA is no longer able to provide its expected energy requirements and is an energy deficient BA. Non-firm exports are curtailed. Energy Emergency Alert 3, that's when the energy deficient BA is unable to meet their contingency reserve requirements any longer. So it, the, the RS test and based on the purpose that the CAISO had put out in their own paper, the RS test should not be passed when any BA is in an energy emergency alert two or three. And that, to me, says that the RS test is not functioning properly and is not producing accurate results. So I think that's, that's one issue that I think would be helpful for CAISO to acknowledge. For BPA, you had asked about priority. This is a very high priority issue. And then I think for the instances when the test is failed, I do agree that there needs to be quite a bit more discussion on what's an appropriate failure consequence to make sure that there's no leaning and that the RS test is incenting forward procurement. The EIM is, was never intended to be a capacity market. The RS test was intended so that everyone comes to the table sufficient before going into the EIM to, for economic displacement energy. And so uh, I just wanted to put my, uh, just those comments in to reiterate, this is a very high priority and we hope to see that CAISO does prioritize these issues. Great, thank you for your feedback, Laura. So we are gonna go ahead and move on to the next topic. 
right. Thanks, Christina. This is well, hey, Danielle Table. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, Danielle, just one second. Hey, this is Brad Cooper. I just wanted to respond to the last question. Um, I believe we did fail the test during the uh, – when we were in the emergency. The, the issue is the ramifications for um, for failing the test, whether you should, you know, what you should do with, with, with the transfers, whether you should hold them at the last level, or I hope I'm getting this right, I'm, I'm not the best expert on the RSC, you know, whether you should hold, hold them at the, at the previous level or whether you should zero them out. And, you know, I guess you're arguing um, that we should zero them out, but you know that's been long discussed, and there's there's reasons uh, a lot of VAs and the EIN didn't want to do that. So I, I just wanted to provide that point of clarification. Yeah, and I think piggybacking on Brad, what or what Brad said, this is Danny again. Some of the fixes that we've identified uh, that Rahul pointed out in his workshop would have caused us to fail the test if they would have been accounted for. So we do think. We are making some fixes, fixes that would make it more accurate and would uh, result in the – or the results would be more in line with what your expectations are if the balancing authority was an EEA, too. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Daniel. All right. So moving on to the next topic of import and export incentives during tight system conditions. We're currently evaluating two options for the proposal that focuses on improving incentives for inner ties during tight system conditions when supply is needed the most. This slide provides a high level overview of the two options we're considering, and then the subsequent slides will get into more detail. So currently, hourly block resources are scheduled in half but are priced based on FMM prices. And the FMM prices can clear below the HASP offer price, which has been highlighted as a concern by market participants. So our first option, which is the preferred approach from a policy perspective, is to modify the settlement of real-time market imports and exports based on the higher of HASP or the FMM LMP during tight system conditions. This option would provide incentives not only for imports, but also for exports, and would avoid introducing potential anomalous outcomes that I'll get into in a couple of slides. That being said, we are still evaluating the feasibility of implementing this option for summer 2021. Our second option is to provide a make whole payment to the bid price for real-time market hourly block economic imports during the identified tight system condition intervals. And this option would only apply to hourly block economic imports. And even though it might be implied, leaving things as is is also an option, and we'd like to get stakeholders' input on that as well. Um, so both of these options are focused on applying the real-time settlement rules when tight system conditions are identified. And Christina, if we move to the next slide, we get into the definition of what tight system conditions means. So we're defining tight system conditions as hours in which the CAISO has issued an alert in the day ahead or has issued a warning or emergency in the real time. We wanted to have something from the operator's perspective that's signaling to the market that things are getting really tight um, so we can have those settlement rules in place to provide the incentives to make sure we have more supply on the system when we need it the most. Um, so, for example, let's assume that the CAISO has issued an alert in the day ahead from hours 16 to 21 for the real-time market. And we get into the real-time and the CAISO has issued a warning for hours 16 to 20. The proposed settlement rules would apply for hours 16 to 21. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, let's move to the next slide. 
So now that we know when we would apply the settlement rules, let's get into each specific option in more detail. So the first option would pay all hourly block imports the higher of the half or the FMM LMP. This rule would also apply to day ahead exports that were reduced in half. Additionally, we would charge all hourly block exports the higher of the half or the FMM LMP. And likewise, this rule would apply to day ahead imports that were reduced in half. Um, these rules would apply for both incremental and decremental schedules. And we're proposing to apply these rules to all hourly block import and export resources, um, and that includes both economic and self-scheduled imports and exports. By applying these settlement rules to all imports and exports, we're not only incentivizing external supply to bid into the ISO market, we're disincentivizing demand bids from relying on ISO markets during the tight system conditions. And further, by applying these rules to both imports and exports, we can avoid potential anomalous outcomes. One of the concerns that has been raised with applying a make whole payment to imports is that you can have overlapping import and export bids and end up receiving a large uplift payment when you're not delivering to the ISO. So for instance, let's say I submit an import bid for 100 megawatts and an export bid for 100 megawatts, both at $800. Cash clears at $800 and both the import and export bid end up clearing. Then we get to FMM and the price goes to $200. Well, the market would charge the export $200 and pay the import $200. Plus, I would get the make whole payment of $600 for not delivering anything because the import and export bid cancel each other out. So one of our intentions for this option was to avoid this exact scenario. Um, a couple more things on this slide that I wanted to point out. It's, it, so we're proposing to not apply this proposal to non-RA generation or PT exports, and we are not proposing to apply these changes to the real-time dispatch settlement that might occur for imports or exports. It's just for FMM. And finally, as I mentioned previously, we're still assessing implementation feasibility for this option. Settlement configuration changes will need to be done before summer 2021, and we're still working internally to assess the feasibility of completing those. So on our last slide here, we get into option two. So we're proposing in this option to provide for a make whole payment to bid prices for real time market hourly block economic imports during the tight system condition hours. This option would apply to only hourly block economic imports and reduced day ahead exports. And additionally, this would only apply when we have an incremental import and decremental export. One potential downfall to this option would be that it could potentially introduce the issue we discussed on the last slide with regards to having overlapping exports and large uplift payments for non-deliveries. But this issue could end up being very unlikely with the export priority changes that we're proposing in the export and load priority topic of this initiative. So during these type system conditions in real time, if we're not clearing exports, then the concern for having overlapping exports is no longer there. So this might, um, this, you know, this issue might not be relevant. Um, so that is all the information I had on this topic. Let me pause and open up the line for any questions. Great, Danielle. Uh, how many questions do we have in the queue, Chris? Can I have four callers in the queue? Okay, and just a reminder to press pound two to raise your hand. So we'll take the first question, please. All right, we're now to our first caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. 
Hi, this is Laura Trelease from the Bonville Park Administration. So I was trying to respond to Brad earlier on the resource efficiency discussion. So um, Brad, I just looking at the data, there were several intervals where CAISO did pass the test while they were in energy emergency alert stage two and in stage three. So that's what I was referring to earlier. I just wanted to clarify that it, it was not the case that CAISO failed every one of those intervals. Oh, okay. And and I, I don't know if this accounts for all of them, but, and, and uh, Danny made the point that even if we passed, we would have failed if we make if we uh, make the changes we're proposing. So I, I don't know whether or not that accounts for all the, the times when we passed when we were in emergency conditions or not. But thanks. Okay. We'll go on to the next question, please. All right, we'll now turn next caller in queue. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hey, Danielle, it's Mark Smith with Calpine. Um, this is going to be imposed during tight system conditions, which you've tried to identify. Um, and I think I fully understand the purpose of this. Um, the price risk between HASP and FMM as it exists today is going to discourage um, import bids. Um, my, my question or my concern, I guess, is that um, during tight system conditions, the ISO operators are going to probably tend to load up the ties um, and that's going to have a price suppressive effect in FMM and real-time dispatch that internal generation um, will suffer. In other words, internal generation won't have access to the premium market that is the hour ahead market with its flat base schedules. Um, I don't know if there's a way to address this. I don't think this proposal does anything to close the gap between HASP and uh, FMM, and really I think it's going to be driven by operator actions. Am I thinking about this right from your perspective, Danielle? Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it, Mark. Um, I, I think the other thing that I want to point out is that, you know, we're really only focusing on applying these settlement rules during the tight system condition hours which we're thinking are a very limited number of hours when the amount of contracted resource adequacy may not be enough to um, meet our load and reserve requirements. Um, so, but we can think about your question a little bit more. Yeah, and I'll certainly put it in writing. And it's probably those tight system conditions where the most revenue from the energy markets is, is available. So, I mean, those are kind of the, that's, that's the downside. Um, it's certainly not a minimal issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chris, we'll move on to the next caller, please. All right, we're on to our next caller. Our caller line is now unmuted. <clears throat> yes, good afternoon. Josh Arnold from PGD. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, further defining uh, tight conditions as you've done. That's, that's very helpful and clear. Um, that helps a lot in our examination of these. Uh, it, it, a couple of clarifying questions first, though, especially on option one. Uh, when you're looking at the HASP awards, you, the KISO optimization generates four 15-minute prices. Are the interties uh, given their dispatch, the block interties given their dispatch based on the simple average of those FMM, uh, sorry, those, uh, those HASP uh, prices, or is, it, uh, is there another optimization algorithm that's used? I'll have to turn to my colleagues for some help answering that. Brad, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, hey, I, I'm sorry. Can, can you repeat the question? I was uh, multi Sure. And I, I heard it halfway, but I make sure I'm hearing it accurately. Just sure, no problem, Brad. Yeah, and this is mainly to just be able to evaluate the, the option one and option two more effectively. So when the block inter ties that are coming in are awarded in the HASP market. It's an economic award based on the estimated advisory HASP LMPs. So there are four HASP yeah. LMPs that are created. The economic award for that, is that based on the simple average of the LMPs? Is it based on the first interval LMP? What's the, what's the, the uh, association between those generated LMPs and the decision to dispatch within the optimization? Or I guess the decision to award would be a better way to put it. 
the decision of award is if they're um, economic over the past horizon. So, you know, at a high level, you can think of it as the average. Um, okay. I think, and, and then uh, under our proposal, it would be, it would be, it would be, the uplift would be the um, the average of the, a bit more correctly, you know, the, the, the four RTPD intervals of the operating hour in the half run. Okay, so simple average. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and then in the higher of under option one, you would again be looking at the simple average of the HASP versus simple average of the FMM LMPs. Um, that's a good clarification. I don't want to. I, I uh, we we could clarify that. I I'm. Um, it's not coming to me. <laughs> what the answer is whether we look at each FMM interval individually or average. I think maybe uh, average also, but um, I don't want to give you a firm answer on that. Really okay. Good. Yeah, yeah that, would be, that would be very helpful. <laughs> As you can imagine, there's quite, quite a bit, there'd be quite a bit of, uh, yeah. of revenue difference between the simple average versus the interval in, in itself. Um, when we were discussing this internally um, leading up to this call, one suggestion, one thought that was raised was if the inter ties are indeed I, economic in hey, I, I, I think it would I sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I thinking about it, 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 it I think it would be the average because you know, if if uh if uh you know, one of if two of the we we, we would we, we would want to look at whether the uh import was compensated over the hour of the delivery. So, you know, it's okay. one of the intervals. In what, one of the intervals in FMM, uh, uh, you know, made it was $1,000, and, 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 uh, and, you know, the other intervals were low, and they, they were adequately compensated to their bid based on the 1000 We wouldn't just give it to that individual interval. Okay, good. That, thank you. That aligns with my thought as well. Uh, one yeah. question we had internally is this seems like a fairly complicated process uh, to do a comparison. If the imports are, in, you know, especially for, you know, for, for tight supply conditions, if they're economic in the half, and I realize that, you know, with Mark's question from Calpine on this, that there may be some concerns here, but why not just straight up pay them the straight half LMP in those conditions using a flag? Says it's you know it's tight schedule, tight supply schedule, you know, conditions, block schedules, and incremental export stuff. Just just straight HASP instead of the higher of. If they're economic under the HASP process, then they're at least economic, and it reduces their price risk in the um, in the FMM markets. And it would it might create some problems of uh, real time imbalance energy uplift. But I think at that point with the the high prices that we would expect in the FMM that it probably wouldn't be too impactful. I'm just putting that out there as a spitball. Mainly as a way to simplify this a little bit given the tight time frame. Yeah, that's something that we could think about. I, our thinking was, you know, we want to um, incentivize the imports, and so um, the higher ups seem to us to provide the greater incentive. Well, one concern I would have with that would be interaction with the reversal of virtual positions from the day ahead, especially if you have a virtual supply that's reversed into a virtual demand within a point close, electrically similar to the intertie point. Now you're starting to reverse positions on one versus the other, and it's always going to be better, better for the uh, for the intertie, and that could open up the the door to some exploitation. I, I think that might not be entirely reasonable from a a you know, cost basis perspective to load. Okay, yeah, something else for, to think about. Okay. Um, the other two que other questions I had, um, operational adjustment, adjustments due to congestion. I assume those would still be done on FMM or RTD LMPs based on when the operational adjustment was, was triggered. The example being yeah. you had a line outage. Okay. Um, and then, again, under option one, 
uh, the interaction of sh- intertie shadow prices. Um, I, I was trying to go through Oasis earlier today, and I couldn't get any shadow prices out of the Hask run. I could see them for the FMM, the RTUP run, but just how the intertie shadow prices for the, uh, the imports and exports would be incorporated. Have you thought about that as well? <laughs> We haven't had the chance to think about that, but um, if you could that's add that to your comments, we'll definitely uh, take a look. We'll do. Uh, that's fair. Uh, and then on option two, what it looks like, just as a simplification, is that basically you would make these uh, intertized quasi-exceptional dispatches from a, um, a compensation standpoint during these conditions where they would always get better, better. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily be eligible to set the LMP in the FMM market because, again, because of the uh, the block schedule option that they've used. Is that correct? A way to look at it. I'm sorry. Okay, I wasn't sorry. following. Can you repeat your... I was sure. I wasn't right. following that, that last question. All right. Hey, can, can I can I just suggest that we 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 really need to keep moving on? Can uh, you know, I, I think you're getting that down into questions that we fully haven't considered. I really appreciate the questions, but it'd that's be fair. most helpful oh, to you know, put those in the comments, and we'll and we'll talk about them. You know, um, um, yes. You know, for, we will be happy here, to do so. To throw out these options, I guess I okay. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next topic. So, Perry, you're on. Thanks, Christina. Can you can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. All right. So in uh, this part of the proposal, we have two separate improvements um, we want to make to our pricing incentives. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is aimed at getting better day ahead scheduling incentives and better incentives to be available in real time when supply is very tight. Uh, in the second uh, proposal uh, that I'm going to talk about is aimed at sending the right pricing signal when supply conditions are so tight that we need to arm load in order to meet our contingency reserve requirements. It's very, uh, uh, a much more narrow sort of um, uh, uh, proposal. So we can move on to the, the next slide. Um, during the heat wave, uh, it was observed that as we approach the day ahead market bid cap, uh, and penalty prices, there may be less uh, than optimal price incentives. So with this first proposal, we would like to incentivize better day ahead scheduling and real-time availability. Uh, the proposal is to raise the real-time market power balance constraint penalty price to $2,000 if any of these three uh, conditions are met in the sub-bullets of the first major bullet here. Uh, the first condition is if the day ahead market uh, SMAC is greater than $800, or if we issue an alert uh, in the day ahead time frame, or if we issue a warning or emergency in the real time. These would be any of these three, uh, if any of these three occur, we would uh, raise the power balance constraint penalty price to $2,000 uh, in the real time market. The key feature here is that the real time market will have a higher penalty price um, than the day ahead market. Uh, in these limited situations, um, you know, this type of proposal also is not that far off from uh, common practice at, at other ISOs. Um, I, and, and higher expected real-time prices uh, should incentivize more virtual demand participation uh, because they will see a higher profit potential. It should disincentivize virtual supply participation as they'll face a higher loss risk. And physical demand would face the potential of paying more for energy uh, if they want to wait till real time uh, uh, to purchase it. You know, finally, you know, we're still considering uh, tweaks we might need to make to this proposal to align uh, with our FERC Order 831 proposal that we developed last year. We could go to the next slide. And, you know, like I said on the previous slide, we, we noticed that less demand is being scheduled in the day ahead market uh, than one might expect when there's scarce supply across the West. Um, under the circumstances, we expected to see more demand scheduled and less virtual supply uh, scheduled. Uh, however, you know, 
if real time prices are not allowed to rise far above day ahead prices and day ahead prices are near the cap, uh, virtual demand has an extremely limited profit potential, uh, which would deter their participation in the day ahead market. Uh, likewise, virtual supply uh, would have a limited loss risk, which would incentivize bidding at or near the cap in the day ahead market. And finally, uh, physical demand has a, a limited loss risk if they can wait until real time to pay the same price or better for, um, for energy. So with the proposal to raise the real time price uh, potential during these circumstances, we would expect more virtual demand participation, less virtual supply participation, and we would expect physical demand to either increase their day ahead schedules or at a minimum, uh, it would give physical demand the incentive to seek intraday capacity uh, if their load forecast was too low in the, in the day ahead time frame. And that would be to avoid needing to purchase power uh, at $2,000. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we have, like I said uh, before, we have a second scarcity pricing proposal as well. This second proposal is aimed at sending the right pricing signal when supply conditions are so tight that we need to arm load in order to meet our contingency reserve requirements. Uh, currently, when we are in an emergency condition, we can arm load to meet our contingency reserve requirements and then release the generators with contingency reserves to meet our energy. We did this during the heat wave. Um, and our current practice of releasing the contingency reserves for use as energy may actually decrease prices at a time when the market should be signaling that supply is so scarce that we are arming load to meet our contingency reserve requirements. Our proposal here is to set prices at the offer cap any time we're arming load to meet our contingency reserve requirement. Um, and this practice would send an appropriate price signal to the market that the supply condition is so dire that we are prepared to drop load if a contingency would occur. And I believe that was the last slide in the scarcity pricing enhancement portion here. So I think we can um, take questions now. Okay, great. Chris, how many do we have in the queue? I currently have nine callers in queue. Okay. Great. First caller, please. I hope not sorry for a caller. Hi, caller. Your line is now unmuted. Hi, Terry. This is Callie Wells with Gridwell Consulting. Um, I have a couple questions, actually. I'll start with the first proposal um, back on, I guess it's slide 25 on the, the web, or the presentation posted online, so um, the one that talks about the, the $2,000 power balance constraints. Um, so I kind of wanted to see if you can elaborate a little bit more on your thinking under the FERC Order 831, because the first order 831, the power balance constraint penalty price will go to 2000 in both the day ahead and the real time. And I, and I understand there's some uncertainty around when the compliance of first order 831 changes will go into place and when what you're referring to as the import bidding and market parameters proposal will go into place. But in general, under first order 831, both the day ahead and real time power balance constraint penalty prices will go to 2000. So I'm trying to, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on what considerations you have or what you have to think through. Is it just really that no matter what the penalty price is in the day ahead, real time is going to be higher? Yeah, I think that's, you know, and this is what we, we want some feedback on from, from stakeholders as well. Is if you're thinking about it the right way. You, let's, let's assume a world where you have uh, first order 831, uh, if you have our uh, – um, proposal for that approved and, and in the tariff. And you have the situation then where we have, we need this, this rule that I'm proposing on this slide um, in addition to it. And you're right, one scenario that could occur is that uh, under FERC uh, Order 831, you could have the higher penalty uh, uh, power balance uh, constraint penalty price in both day ahead and real time. So what we would need to consider, you know, what I mentioned on this slide was that a key feature here to get these incentives is, is that the real-time market um, prices can go higher than they can go in day ahead. So, so I think you're right. What we need to consider is if, if 
FERC Order 831, if that proposal is, um, you know, triggered on a certain day where the penalty prices can go higher, then would we need to also consider uh, a higher than $2,000 uh, penalty price in real time on, on those days as well for this proposal to, you know, to do what we what we want it to do? So that's, yeah, you know, that's what we were thinking. Of. And then, Brad, I think you might have wanted to jump into that. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, this, this is Brad Cooper. Hey, Kelly. Um, I just want to clarify, don't, this, this proposal is not meant to um, be related to our FERC 831 proposal. Uh, you know, it is, it is similar to our 831 proposal in that it involves not setting the power balance constraint to 2,000 all the time, which, you know, for, the, for all the reasons we've discussed in FERC Order 831, uh, we didn't want to do. But like Perry said, this 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 proposal is aimed at addressing the situation where the real time power balance constraint, uh, and hence the maximum price in the real time market, is at the bid cap, and then the adverse or not strong enough incentives, at least in the day ahead market, exist because you know, for example, the simple example is 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 virtual supply. Uh, Dating and clearing at a thousand and day head market, and that's a no lose proposition. And, and the, the second bullet is, and, and we said considering, and, and we, we just caveated it that way because that occurred to us honestly uh, just recently that that okay under this proposal where we want the the maximum potential prices in the real time market to be higher than the bid cap, so we. We address those day head market incentives. Then we thought, well, okay, hold on, wait a minute. What about once 831 is in place and our our uh, 831 uh, import bidding to market parameters isn't? Like, well, I guess it doesn't even matter. But 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 you know, when we when we switch when we when we switch to at times when we switch to a two thousand dollar bid cap, does that mean then? We even need a higher power balance constraint relaxation price in the real time market. I, and I think the answer probably is yes. Uh, we just caveated it here because that I recently dawned on us and we haven't fully thought through the implications. You know, maybe for some reason that's not necessary under the 2000 cap or something. Okay, I, I appreciate that discussion. Um, I guess my ask would be in the paper that you guys put out if you can maybe walk through what you anticipate the um, power balance constraint penalty prices to be under two different scenarios. One is when, if, you know, we're in a situation where FERC Order 831 compliance filing is effective, um, absent this import bidding and market parameters proposal, and then another scenario where we're in a world where both the FERC Order 831 compliance filing and the import bidding and market parameters proposal are in place, because those have two different implications on the power balance constraint penalty price. Um, so if you can include that in the paper, I think that would be extremely helpful. And then I do Thanks, have Kelly. one other question. question. Yeah, and I do have, sorry, I, I won't, I'll have a quick question um, on your contingency reserve proposal. I'm trying to walk through my head, um, or I guess lining up when this would occur relative to when AS scarcity pricing um, would be triggered. So I was reading through the final root cause analysis and it, it explained, um, you guys did a great job there explaining this mechanism. And it sounds like this, you guys released the contingency reserves almost prior to, I think what the market would see as AS shortage, um, because it still looks like on the analysis that when you guys were um, releasing these contingency reserves, you weren't short AS yet. Um, so do I have that right, that these contingency reserves will be released before AS scarcity would be triggered, and then you would get into a situation where you have AS scarcity? Am I thinking um, through that yeah, correctly? So, yeah, so there's, uh, so this is a, a um, 
uh, you know, the, you know, the, the arming of the, of the load is, is an operator um, decision point. And, you know, your question is, if we're trying, you know, if we're trying to procure more uh, uh, AS in real time than we, than we procured day ahead, and we need to um, arm arm load. I think that would be the example in which there might be a a, a pricing impact. Um, I think if you look back at the, what happened in the heat wave, we were arming this. Uh, I believe we were meeting our AS requirements, um, and we were going to have uh, trouble meeting our um, energy requirements. So what they do whenever you're in an emergency situation is you can arm the load to meet the contingency reserve, so then you can have access to the generation order to meet your energy requirement. Um, so I, I believe, you know, unless we have someone else on, on, on as a panelist that can answer this more directly, I believe that the arming of the load happens. You're still meeting your contingency reserve requirements. The situation is your you may not be able to meet your energy requirements. So you do this swap, so then you can use the, the generator to, to meet the energy requirements. Yes. So, Perry, this is Dave Delpart. I can help out a little bit here maybe. I, I, I think I got the thing. I'm having some computer and uh, other issues here at home. But w what happens is the operators on the floor, when they have to start releasing their contingency reserves to meet the load, then we have to go and we have to arm load to replace those contingency reserves because we always have to have that uh, contingency reserve requirement met. So we'll, we'll release some of our contingency reserves, serve the load, but then we'll have to arm up, you know, arm up the load to provide the contingency reserve. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, I can try to clarify a little more. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. I'm just trying to figure out the pricing impact this would have and kind of the ordering we would expect to see in the market, like do you anticipate the contingency reserves would be released? We're seeing prices at the bid cap. Then we run into an AS shortage condition, so we're seeing the scarcity of pricing from that just in the 15-minute market, not the five. And then I don't want to complicate this even further, but then my, my big picture question, honestly, what I'm trying to get at the end is, so you guys go through this and we see higher prices, and then we hit into load. We get into load shedding conditions. Um, what prices, or is there anything that you guys are thinking of doing that would keep prices high once we started shedding load and we're not having to arm contingency reserves? We're not in AS shortage conditions anymore because we've started to shed load. Because um, we, I think we saw this back in August where once the load was shed, prices came back down. So I'm just, I'm trying to think through kind of with all these scarcity pricing proposals, um, kind of the trend, how prices will increase as conditions get tighter and tighter, and then eventually what will happen once load is shed. Um, I know that's a loaded question, and there's a lot of people I'm sure that want to chime in here. So I will, if you guys can think about that, I will continue thinking about it, um, and then maybe we can have another discussion um, through the paper and yeah, it, have another cycle to call. And, um, Kelly, this is Brad. Um, you know, I know we're calling this scarcity pricing, that this is, you know, this is uh, <laughs> scarcity pricing light. You know, it, it's not, I, I think some of the stuff you're talking about, like prices gradually increasing as conditions get worse, that requires a lot more expensive scarcity pricing uh, design and changes that, that will be part of the, the, the longer term scarcity pricing initiative, you know, that, that kind of stuff wouldn't be feasible by this summer. So, you know, these are just targeted fixes to address uh, some anomalies that we've observed that we can address relatively simply. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, so we still have a, a lot of slides to cover, so let's take one more question on this topic and move on. All right, moving on to our next caller in queue. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. 
Yes, hi, this is Ian White with Shell Energy. Um, I missed the cutoff for the um, HASP versus FMM um, uh, conversation. Um, and just, I guess, real quick, since time is of the essence, um, you know, Shell Energy would support option one um, as an improvement over the status quo. While we um, see large disparities uh, between the HASP and FMM pricing, um, during stress system conditions. And further, and, and, and I, I didn't quite understand what you considered the definition of a tight system condition, and so I just wanted to make sure that that would apply under the proposal when a flex alert or a warning was issued in day ahead, or flex alert, a warning, emergency, or energy emergency alert one to three is declared in real time. So if that is indeed what the um, definition is, then I think that, that that's reasonable. And, and the, I guess my final comment would be, um, you know, if, if, if HASP is a, is a good enough tool to dispatch resources, um, it makes sense that in, under certain circumstances, it would be good enough to be financially binding. Thanks. Okay. Hey, Christina, since okay. that is not specific yes, to this topic, yes. do you want to allow one, one more caller? Sure, yeah, that's fine, Perry. Okay. All right, we're about to our next caller in queue. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is Kathleen Colbert from Distra. Can you hear me? Sure can. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, can you go back to, I guess, the slide? Uh, your 28, the web 25, this is $2,000, it's the address fitting incentives, I think it's 28. Okay, great. Um, so my question here, this conversation and discussion has been really helpful. Um, I understood what Brad said and I agree with him as I'm, and I caught, I should say, I caught this before you mentioned in the clarification, but thanks for the clarification to reaffirm this, that this isn't, this piece isn't, you're not trying to really touch any part of the scarcity pricing. You're trying to incentivize loads to offer into the day ahead. Um, I, like you said, I appreciate that clarification um, for the stakeholder community. I, I did want to raise that I think that this approach is, oh, frankly, overly complicated as a solution, especially since we're targeting a near-term solution um, to the problem statement. And one thing that, and I, you know, forgive me, it's been a while since I've read the old energy crisis orders out of the fun FERC process that occurred after that for years. Um, but one of these things that happened, you know, I mean, the concern that insufficient amount of loads were coming into this and were being procured in advance what in the market was discussed in that process. The solution that was identified at the time and adopted by the CAISO was a, a bidding requirement for loads to um, bid in at least 95% of their loads into the day ahead market. If that is, if, and I recognize, I, you know, from our part, let's look for solutions, let's look for solutions that have precedence, let's look for ones that don't create potentially adverse market pricing impacts, which is what this proposal looks, you know, appears to me to have a risk of. And I think that the solution of the 95% requirement, which I could, uh, removed from its market rules at some time, um, it might merit revisiting that as a simpler, more effective, targeted solution to the concern that you're identifying here. Thanks, thanks, Kathleen. I did have one kind of follow-up question with you. I, you know, I can un I understand sure. that maybe a simpler solution um, um, might be better. I, I did want, you know, since this is kind of a, a, a proposal slide deck, I did want to know if you could describe what you mean by it might have a potential adverse um, uh, incentive or pricing uh, impact by having higher uh, prices in, in, the, in the real time than day ahead, or higher, I should say higher potential prices in real time than day ahead? Yeah, no, no, that's totally fair. And thank you, Perry, and thank you for, you know, uh, taking my suggestion back and thinking about it um, after after this meeting. So. Teasing on that a little bit, so I would say that, you know, I, th 
I think I understand the proposal, kind of what you're trying to do. It appears on first blush, and I acknowledge that these are just lies and just a quick call, um, but it appears on first blush that by having the, you know, let's say the CAPS or just call it the PVC, whatever, so by having the CAPS um, almost artificially be at two separate levels in day ahead versus real time, while it might incentivize the behaviors that you're pointing out, it could also disincentivize other things. You know, part of, of, of even virtual being created originally um, was as a mechanism to um, provide a greater incentive for supply to try and offer into the day ahead market as well. And we want to incentivize supply resources to participate in the day ahead as much as, as much as you want to incentivize loads to be participating in day ahead. And I, I also add one more thing, which is convergence bids have their, have their benefits as a hedging instrument. They also raise um, sometimes complicated questions when we look at them from, you know, a market um, from a bidding behavior perspective. Uh, we, anytime I see sort of rules that kind of create um, incongruity between the day ahead and the real time, um, it raises questions about what might virtual bidding look like. And I guess that we're, you're trying to incentivize a certain behavior, but we need to think through very carefully if it's in incentivizing other less favorable behaviors that could and you know could look like could not be the kind of market participation that we'd like to see. I say we because I include every part of the market, right? Um, and it also brings up the question of if you know <laughs> do we don't want to continue to raise questions of well why do we have convergence bids if we're if by definition in our market design trying to diverge prices, it it brings up fundamental questions about well what value and purpose of convergence bids during that time frame. It just brings up lots of things. So those are just a couple of things that came to mind very quickly. Sure, thanks. I, I have the note uh, on on that. Um, uh, and we'll have to, yeah, we'll have to think about that and, and kind of compare that with what is actually common practice at, at a lot of other ISOs where they have higher uh, potential prices in real time than, than day ahead. Um, but thank you, thank you for the uh, for the thoughts, and, yeah. and we'll have to think about it. No, of course. And I just throw out one other thing, which I know I've made this call before, but to consider these measures as temporary. And so I think that you know my suggestion, I'm, if you can take it in that light, I do consider, and we'll continue to ask for these to be considered temporary um, interim measures. But even take my suggestion to include that. So I just want to clarify that as well. Thanks, Kathleen. All right, Danny, are you on the line? Yep, still here. So this next, this next topic is reliability demand response resources. We would like them to function better in our market than they did in the summer of 2020. So when we started looking at how do we get them to function better, we really encountered two separate problems. The first is barriers that prevent these from being optimally dispatched in the market. When you get into the weeds on this, RDRR is modeled as a resource, but is reflected as less load via telemetry. So what ends up happening is operations have to manually account for an RDRR resource being dispatched by biasing the load to account for those megawatts to avoid double counting of RDRR. So our proposed change would be to incorporate the RDRR dispatch into the load forecast. I would note that the same functionality would also apply to PDRs because the same phenomenon occurs with PDRs. The second barrier to uh, being dispatched optimally in the market would be the observed performance differing significantly from the credited or dispatched amounts. So ISO would propose to make a change to allow our system operations to adjust that load forecast feedback loop we discussed on the previous bullet to respond to any uh, non-optimal or uh, uh, not full performance per dispatch. So these are two changes, they're, they're very similar. They just get back to being able to account for the RDRR megawatts within our load forecast to make this 
cleaner for system operations to use in real time. Next slide. So the second issue when we look at the RDR resources are what are their impacts on our pricing? The market currently only dispatches RDRRs in RTD. RTPD does not give them startup instructions like other resources. The proposed solution would be to include these RDRR resources in RTPD and is scheduled in RTPD to hold the RTPD schedules in RTD. Including RDRRs in RTPD will account for RDRRs startup and minimum run times, ensuring they are more optimally dispatched. Well, what I mean by this is currently the RTD horizon looks out about an hour. The minimum ramp, or the maximum ramp time for these resources is 40 minutes. The maximum minimum run time is one hour. So you have the potential phenomenon where the a market interval they're being dispatched in is not looking out across the ramp time and minimum run time of these resources. So shifting these into RTPD for dispatch should eliminate that issue. Our second point is exploring modifications to allow RDRRs to set the market clearing price. This kind of gets into the mechanics of how these are dispatched and modeled in the ISO market. Uh, once we have resolved this issue, we are also performing outreach to market participants to explore the feasibility of spreading their RDR, the bids within their RDRR portfolios out between $950 and $1,000. Currently, these resources are not often optimally dispatched in the market due to the issues that I identified on the previous slide. Once they are, having some spread within their bid should allow the market to uh, come to a more efficient dispatch with these resources uh, when you combine that with also including them in RTPD rather than RTD. The other thing that having a bigger bid spread would aid in is some of the resources are, some of the resources are actually part of the same program but have multiple resource IDs with them or residing in different sublaps within the ISO. So this should also give the market participants better control over their programs being dispatched as a whole based off uh, bid price rather than parts of their programs being dispatched if they all have the same uh, bid. So those are the RDRR changes. It, it, it was quick. I ran through this quick being cognizant of time, but I'd like to open it up for questions if anybody has any. Hey, Chris, how many do we have in the queue? So we have three callers and four callers in the queue. All right, we're on to our first caller in queue. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hey, Danny, it's Mark Smith with Calpine again. I, I, I don't understand the first issue. Um, I hope I, I hope I do. Let me try to explain it in my words. Um, you have uh, the RDRR program as a, as a resource now, um, but when it's dispatched, because you're using telemetry, it shows up as a load reduction. So they're essentially, from a, from a market balance standpoint, you're double counting the reduction because you show it as a resource and it shows up as a load reduction. Is, is that a, the essence of the issue here? Short of manual operator intervention, that would be the outcome. Good. Okay. And so, and so, so, so you, I'm sorry. Go so, on. is your is is your proposal then to essentially add back the RDRR into the load forecast so that price formation still reflects the right supply demand balance? Yes. Okay, that's what ERCOT does, for instance. Uh, that's very, very beneficial, thanks. Um, secondly, are you, is there anything that you're going to do to, to improve the durability of the price response that comes from RDRR? In other words, I can see if you put it in RTPD that for one 15-minute interval, it could set the price, um, but thereafter, uh, the load reduction will show up, even if it's modified by your load biasing, I guess, um, and it will no longer fit into price formation, even though you are interrupting, you know, load. Is, is there anything in your proposal that improves the durability of the price pricing? I don't think that we 
directly address that issue. We kind of try to get to it through uh, the market outreach to have a better bid spread that at least when that does occur, it would hopefully be for maybe potentially smaller resources with shorter minimum run times. Okay, so if you had more granular resources, you could dispatch them over longer periods of time, which might have more of a price effect. Uh, but I got to yeah. think if you're if you're running up at 950 bucks, you're going to burn through that all of that very very quickly. I don't know, but I would think. Okay, thanks, Danny. I appreciate those those clarifications. Thanks, Mark. Okay, next question, Chris. All right, we're on to our next caller. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Our caller, please be sure your device isn't on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I was on mute. Sorry. So, how many minutes prior to the market run does RTPD dispatch? I'm sorry, this is Alan Mech from SDG&E. The current RTD or RTPD? RTPD. Uh, it, it depends which run that you're looking at. It can the, – the stuck run, I believe, goes up to four and a half hours out, but the shorter runs are more in the line of the seven or eight intervals. And somebody – if anybody else wants to chime in on that on the panel, that would be appreciated. This is Don. Is your question, how soon is the market run before the financially binding FMM? In that case – the market start initializes 37 and a half minutes prior to the 15 minute interval. Oh, okay, so it's the same as FMM. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, on the way to think about it is. Yeah, the way to think about it is FMM is just the financially binding 15 minute interval of the RT, various RTPD runs. Okay. Um, all right, so that would mean if RDRR was dispatched, they would, the people operating the resource would have um, 37 and a half minutes prior to the start of the event to trigger um, their DR. But actually, the result, the result post for the financial binding, uh, 22 and a half minutes prior to flow after the market's completed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. Thank you. Hey, Chris, we have one more in the queue? Yeah, we do have one more caller in queue. Thank you. Our caller line is now unmuted. This is Paul Nelson with Clica. Can people hear me okay? Yes, hi, Paul. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so Alan asked the question I was going to, because I was trying to understand the alphabet soup here on R so RTD is the five minute dispatch and then yeah. real time what does PD stand for? Uh, PDRs are proxy RT demand response. Well, I, I know oh. that but R real RTPD yeah. real time what does that stand pre for? Pre-dispatch. Pre and that's part of, that's part of the 15 minute model right? Yeah, it's, it's okay. one of the the, right. the the FMM is one of the RTPD intervals we're running, but we run advisory right. runs out into the future. Okay, um, so that answers the question. So the other issue has is I think is yeah on this page here the last bill on the page of of spreading out the portfolio. I think that's going to have some complications because then. It, Within a program, are you basically saying some get dispatched before others? I and, think uh, and how does I, that work? I think I think within a program you could group your bids together at the same price to have a better chance of them all getting dispatched together. Because short of that, if everything's bid in at 950, huh. like is done right now, then they will be dispatched all over the place. Parts of programs will be dispatched. What I'm just saying is, is because we're dispatching a single resource ID, 
what I'm saying is, is on this one, especially for utility programs and the nature of, of taking a long time to change tariffs and design programs, you know, it implies that, you know, two different people or, or groups on an air conditioning cycling program that have different prices, you know, should they be, you know, should they be compensated the same or differently? I don't quite follow that question. You, well, you're implying you, by distinguishing them, one group gets dispatched, but the other doesn't. So there's a frequency element. I mean, unless this thing, you know, goes, you know, it's, you know, the hockey stick, and this is always going to hit a thousand, and then of course your issue is moot, because if there's anything priced between nine fifty and a thousand, it all gets dispatched. But what you're saying is you think there's granularity in the market between that point. And so in that case, there's there's going to be some, there could be some DR that's dispatched and some isn't, but yet they're in the same program. So this is I said from from Kaiso's perspective, it's not an issue, but from the retail function, this is an issue. I I understand that, and I think we would leave it up to the the program administrators to try to resolve that. Maybe they have rotating groups. I, yeah. I'm not sure what the solution is, but I do agree that that's not something we would be right. able to address within this stakeholder process. Right, but what I'm saying is, is for a summer 2021 readiness, there's a lot of issues that have to be dealt with here, and I don't know if that's feasible <laughs> for a summer 2021. Okay, I I understand. I mean, your the utilities the utilities can chime in on this one, but uh, the, you know because they you know they're the ones that ultimately have the program designed, but. You know, from the from the groups that I yeah. represent, that would be something I would have to go back to my members and go, um, yeah, this is what's going on. Some of, some of you may get right. dispatched more than others because of this pricing spread. I understand that we we have uh, right. performed initial outreach to the utilities, and I know that they're exploring the feasibility of this with, within the tariffs. But right. I would add that like. For each resource, it does not have to have the same bid every day. Like, th there are mechanisms if you wanted to spread out the amount of performance that RDRRs would be exposed to, to spread that out. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Christina, do we have any other questions? We do have one more question. You want to take that and then move on? Sure. All right. All right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vista again. Can you hear me? Yes, Kathleen. Um, Danny, I have a clarifying question and then potentially a suggestion. But a uh, clarifying question is um, on your slide, your first slide, I believe it is, um, RDR is modeled as a resource. Can you just clarify for me if each individual RDR are resources modeled at a given price, or if are they um, like a, a single resource or a couple resources? I believe that they're a single resource, but I would defer to uh, anybody else on the panel if my understanding is incorrect on that. Danny, this is John Good. RDR, there's yeah. many, many resources. Yeah, that's okay. That's a, that's what I thought. Thank you, John. Okay, no, that's helpful. So when you are describing, so in the next kind of the idea about exploring feasibility, spreading it out, we're talking about let's many, many, many resources that currently are maybe all at one thousand when released, and and having that be spread to more price points at, on those different resources between that nine fifty to thousand. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's, I think, the general okay. idea that we had. Um, okay, cool, that's helpful. Um, this is, uh, I, I have a follow-up and um, maybe suggestion or request to consider um, and have further discussions on, and, and I'm, it's, it's a bit of a mix of this and a bit of a mix of um, the scarcity, kind of the, the conversation about what, what do we do when we're in, like, a load shed event. Um, the con but the functionality you're describing in your first slide about you know how um, it's being telemetered and so you need to you're looking in um, to account for 
um, the add back essentially to avoid double counting. Um, if I, I'd like to ask the Kaiser if you could take back to the team and kind of think through, is there something feasible for this summer that takes an approach that maybe leverages some of this functionality, um, not only for when RDR is released, RDRs, excuse me, but also for when a manual load shed is done. So like in the event of a load shed, load biasing to add that back to the load forecast and then including in the stack, and I'll just call it an artificial resource, but a single modeled resource that represents the load shed equivalent so that um, that, mo that single modeled load shed resource is backing that, you know, added back load for the biasing, um, and you could value that at a price and it would be clear in your market. And in that way, I think you could capture the pricing associated with the scarcity, maybe through leveraging this functionality and then um, treating that load shed as a modeled resource. I just was wondering if you could, you know, just take the idea back and, and talk about it amongst the team or some version of that sure that's a, maybe address that issue. Yeah, yeah, that's something that we can uh, inter internally give some thought to. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. All right, Christina, I think we should, in, in respect of time yeah. and the couple other yeah. topics, move this along. So thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, is, uh, is Gabe on the line? Yeah, hi, Christina, this is Gabe. Great, thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, this is Gabe Bertha, uh lead policy analyst here at California ISO. Um, wanted to just say a couple things about storage resources uh, for summer 2021. Um, this particular policy isn't going to have any um, proposal for any new tools or uh, technologies to be built to manage storage, but it is important and there are several other things going on concurrently with this initiative that we wanted to mention, and we are planning to, in light of um, summer 2021 coming up, move forward some of the proposals that we initially um, included in resource adequacy. So just so everybody's on the same page here, um, the ISO and the CPUC are anticipating that there's going to be about 1,700 megawatts of storage resource adequacy capacity available to the market, to the California markets in summer 2021. Um, that compares to about 550 megawatts that's dispatchable on the California ISO system right now, and it uh, corresponds to about 200 megawatts um, that was available, say, a year ago. So these numbers are increasing very rapidly, um, and it's gonna, going to take a lot of changes in tools and technologies to be able to manage these resources during the most critical times on our um, grid going forward. Uh, we are working on these initiatives in several different places. Um, there's a few tools that are still planned to go in place, including market power mitigation for storage resources in the ESDER 4 initiative. Um, in the resource adequacy enhancement initiative, we've proposed a tool called the Minimum State of Charge, or MSOC, requirement. And that requirement essentially ensures that storage resources will be able to achieve their day-ahead market discharge schedules for energy in the real-time market. Um, there's some fundamental differences in how the day-ahead markets work and the real-time markets work, but um, just a very high-level view here, the day-ahead market considers a full 24 hours of optimization. So for storage resources, this works really well. It can come up with the optimal times, you know, to charge a four-hour duration battery and the optimal time to discharge a four-hour duration battery, including the peak net load hours when those storage resources or when we're anticipating those storage resources to be critical to meet the needs of the ISO system. So we need to have those resources charged to meet those peak, load, peak net load needs. Um, in the real-time market, it does not do that. Uh, the real-time market only looks out for one um, binding interval and 12 advisory intervals, so about an hour and five minutes beyond the current market condition. So if you're at um, very low prices in the middle of the day when there's a lot of solar and loads are relatively low, um, the real-time market 
considers the bids for the storage resources and but does not consider um, loads that may occur or, uh, later in the day and needs uh, that, that may be required from those storage resources. So we've put, like I said, we've put together a tool in the Resource Adequacy Enhancement Policy, um, which is going to uh, into a, a final proposal, which will be uh, discussed at the March Board of Governors meeting. And that proposal does include this real-time feature that would require that resource adequacy resources be charged at a certain level in the real-time market. And we would be planning to observe those states of charge on days when um, it was most critical for the ISO's need. And we're discussing those particular triggers in that resource adequacy enhancement policy. So if you're interested in joining in on this discussion, um, I, you know, I'm not planning to discuss the merits or the specifics of the policy here, but we will be having a discussion on February 23rd. Uh, with the rest of the final proposal for the Resource Adequacy Enhancement Initiative. Um, so I would encourage everyone uh, who wants to to join us there in that discussion. Um, at the same time, if we could advance to the next slide, please, Christina. Um, at the same time, we're also working on some additional changes internally to how we manage batteries. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on is updates and enhancements to the AGC algorithm that we currently use. Um, we, we've identified that it's possible for the AGC today to uh, deplete storage resources, and we are working to on potential enhancements to that algorithm so that um, storage resources are not overly depleted and can continue to be used for um, AGC as um, they're online for AGC already. And this is particularly um, important when storage resources have multiple hours when they're scheduled for regulation. We're also, at the same time, um, and, and by the way, we hope to have um, the AGC tool up and running for summer 2021. We also have, hope to have the changes that we proposed in resource adequacy enhancements up and running for summer 2021. Finally, we're also building two new tools um, for uh, operations to manage storage resources. Um, the first tool is pretty easy. It's just simply a screen that the operators uh, will be able to see the entire storage fleet, their state of charge, their potential state of charge on an individual resource basis and aggregated on a, um, I think it's, I think it's aggregated on a TAC basis as well. Um, and then the second thing that we're developing is um, essentially in the event that the ISO does need to issue out of market um, dispatches to storage will essentially be using the same exceptional dispatch provisions that we have in place today. Uh, so it's not so much of a change there. It, it's just sort of an update on um, how the how the ISO is going to be managing the dispatch of um, storage resources if indeed we do need to exceptionally dispatch them. Um, so maybe I'll just check really quickly if we have anybody in the queue and maybe take one or two questions, and then I do think we need to move on to the next topic. Operator, is there anyone in the queue? I do have five callers in the queue. Okay. I think we can take two questions at this time, and then we'll move on to the next topic. All right. We'll announce our first caller in queue. Hi, right, caller. Your line is now unmuted. Hello, Gabe. Um, this is Alvis Pobota at BGE. Um, hey, Alvis. want to take... How are you? Um, one Doing well, thank you. Is, good, good. I think the second slide is a very good direction for you to be going, and uh, I'm glad to see these operational steps being taken. The first slide, I um, have some qualms about, not so much because if it were if um, if it were done correct, if it were done uh, reliably and correctly, I think it, it, it there, there's 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 not much of an issue with it, but I think mm -hmm. currently there are. Uh, a lot of um, uh, steps still to be uh, taken to make sure that telemetry in real time of state of charge is being read properly by KISO because it's actually yeah. being enforced in the market. And the other issue that accompanies that is that um, market participants don't currently have any transparent visibility of what the KISO is seeing. Um, and as an example, we're 
currently in a situation where we have a battery that um, is not getting correct telemetry. Kaiso is not seeing correct telemetry. We're not sure why, um, but the telemetry the Kaiso is seeing is that the, <clears throat> the battery is at zero state of charge. The battery is actually at full state of charge, and so the consequence mm -hmm. of that for this, this kind of constraint is essentially the Kaiso is in fact sending us charging instructions whenever whenever mm -hmm. possible. Um, in order to, and, and this isn't even to get it to a, a, a minimum state of charge, it's just because that's the only thing that can be done with a battery that's, zero, that's at zero state of charge. So if there's any bid that's in the money, it will be charged. So in the case of a minimum state of charge, this would lead to spurious charge instructions being sent, and, mm -hmm. and then worse, once one enters into the peak period where one's day, day ahead um, discharge has been awarded, the zero state of charge will not allow Kaiso's market systems to send a real-time discharge instruction on that resource. So um, unless you mm -hmm. relax the, the, uh, the way in which you're using the telemetry in the market systems, this can have very perverse results, I think. And, and mm -hmm. in, the time for, in the time frame that we're talking about, it, I think it's a, very, it's, a, it's a risky way to try to get what you're looking for. There might be less risky ways to get the same thing, like simply mm -hmm. requiring people to self-schedule their day at award um, uh, and then manage their state of charge around that. But I, I think trusting the Kaiso systems at this point with a very short period of time before, uh, you know, we, we have to be 100% sure that these systems are robust. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the, uh, the, that that's not necessarily the best way for you to be um, preparing for the summer uh, issues with, uh, as, as far as they apply to storage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, Alva, I do appreciate those comments. Um, and I know that we are looking into the specific telemetry issues that you brought up. And I, I do think that we're, um, you know, working on, on nailing down um, what those issues are and how we can correct them. Um, I think that would be something that would also be, you know, sort of ongoing work that the KISO is doing. But I, I do appreciate your comments, um, and I think that's good feedback. Thank you. Um, operator, can we move to the next call, please? All right, moving on to our next caller. Our caller live now unmuted. Hi, okay, this is Mike Tascolano from the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, so, you know, we've had some conversations about this uh, sort of in line with what Alva would say, and I do, want, I do want to point out that you guys have now gone back and forth a few times about how and when you plan to have this activated, uh, the min charge requirement. A couple weeks ago you were saying it was whenever 110%. It was whenever non-storage resources were less than 110%, although I didn't get any details on how and when that would be measured. Then I've also been told you guys don't really know how you're going to do it, but you're going to figure it out. And now you're sort of back to this um, peak net load plus a reserve margin that's not defined. So, you know, that obviously can make a big difference. But more importantly right now, I want to ask you guys in terms of summer 2021, I still don't see FERC approving this. I think there's a very big risk to this min charge requirement being your primary method of dealing with storage for the coming summer because, um, you know, in stakeholder comments, you've gotten almost universal opposition to, you know, at a minimum to getting this in place by summer 2021 because people don't think it's developed. Um, and also extremely widely, including the PUC and a lot of other organizations, to doing this at all because we think it is, um, you know, going to lead to tons of inefficiencies, possible reliability issues. Uh, it seems um, blatantly discriminatory and just, you know, I, I'm stunned that it's still being talked about, frankly. Um, but it is. So, but I, I still, I'm not sure that, uh, FERC is going to approve this, and if you guys don't have another strategy, that's really concerning. Yeah, I, I would agree, Mike. Um, let's continue this conversation at that stakeholder call on February 23rd. Okay, All right. We're going to go ahead and move on. So, Perry, are you on the line? Yes, if you can hear me, I am. 
We can hear you. Thanks. All right. Uh, so let's talk about system market power mitigation. Um, in addition to reliability, as the market operator, uh, we have the responsibility to ensure uh, that the markets are operated efficiently. And this includes ensuring rational price formation as well as, as mitigating market power. Um, we talked about how we're proposing scarcity pricing reforms uh, that could increase prices. We want to do this in a balanced way and be protected in the event uh, that suppliers attempt to economically withhold supply when supply conditions are tight and there's structurally uncompetitive a supply mix in the market. So our proposal here is to move forward with the system market power mitigation policy um, that we developed last year in step with the short-term scarcity pricing proposals that I talked about earlier. And we would move to um, implement both of those uh, proposals uh, together in August of 2021. Uh, that's, you know, that's all I have on, on, on this topic. Uh, Christina, were there any questions in the queue or um, yeah, except for I was on mute. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's check to see um, if we have a question in the queue. Chris, hey, it looks like there's four, but we'll, we'll, maybe we could take a question. I didn't send a chat about um, us scheduling another call this week um, to give stakeholders an additional opportunity to ask questions. So um, let's, let's go ahead and go to the queue. All right. Moving on to our first caller. Caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, Terry. This is Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, so the CAISO put out a market notice on in November on SNPM, so just this past November, um, and it said that you guys would develop this contingency plan to bring this back maybe in 2021. Um, but it said you would only do this if there was further analysis that showed there was a strong need to move forward. So I'm wondering if you've done an analysis or, or why this is coming back. Right. So I recall that in November there was the initial um, analysis that we had presented at the market surveillance committee meeting um, just on, on what the performance of um, this proposal would have been during the, the heat wave. And I think that we have made um, updates to uh, that analysis that we plan to talk about at uh, the market surveillance committee meeting um, coming up. Uh, and, you know, I think that the gist of it, and this might not directly uh, answer your, your question, but I think that the gist of it is, is that, you know, what we're weighing here is on, on one hand we have these scarcity pricing reforms uh, that will raise prices, and on the other uh, hand we have this responsibility that, to ensure markets are operated um, efficiently. Um, and, you know, although prices were very high uh, during the heat wave, I think it's, it's now known that system-wide uh, mitigation probably would not have uh, lowered prices during, during the heat wave. Uh, what this means, though, is, is there would – so there would not be – much pricing harm when 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 the supply is truly scarce. Uh, and on the other hand, though, you know, we think that there are uh, market efficiency benefits of system market power mitigation to prevent suppliers from uh, economically withholding um, supply when they when they control enough supply to be pivotal. So we really are um, uh, trying to balance these two things here. So I I'm not really sure saying there, but I'll just note, I, I know we're running out of time, so I just want to say this briefly. I think, um, one, stakeholders need to understand clearly the interactions and potential unintended consequences between 831, between, you know, you can call it scarcity, but it's not. It's a scarcity light if you're summer price rules, um, and SMPM. 
And I know Brad had said you haven't even thought through really how um, your summer pricing proposal in 831 will interact, but CAISO is part of a broader market. And, you know, supply and demand need to understand their market exposure for the summer. And merely talking about things like um, throwing out there that you might potentially raise the real-time penalty price to $3,000, you're moving hedging markets. So the faster the CAISO can clearly articulate to stakeholders um, what is going to happen this summer and why, I think the better. Um, I also think there is a huge disincentive for imports to um, bring their supply to the CAISO with system market power. Um, and that the CAISO hasn't seen increasingly um, not competitive conditions. In fact, DMM has shown that conditions have gotten more competitive. So if you're going to do system market power mitigation, I don't believe it belongs in this initiative. I mean, it's your right to do system market power if you believe conditions are worse, but it shouldn't be pitched as a solution um, to what happened last summer. Summer readiness should concentrate on what your root cause analysis showed um, and solutions to the problems you identified. And you, in fact, identified there were no problems with market power last summer. So thank you for letting me get on my soapbox, Perry. Yep, that's fair, fair comment. Brad, did I hear you You have something else that you wanted to add? Uh, that's okay. I think you you gave a, a good response. Good response. So Chris, how many, uh, do we have in the queue right now? I have four more callers in the queue. Okay, so we do have uh, quite a few slides um, James needs to run through his slides. We uh, again, we will we will host a call on Friday morning um, to respond to additional questions. But I think we we probably need to move on and then. Um, why don't we take call. another? Uh, okay. Why don't we okay. take another comment? Or, why, why don't we take another comment or two on this topic? This is yeah. an important topic. Sure. And no as Thanks. long as everyone's okay with going over a little bit. Okay, Chris, we'll go to the next question, please. All right, we're on to our next caller. Hi, caller, your line is now unmuted. Uh, thanks, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Um, first, I'll say, Brad, I never thought we would end sharply at 4 p.m. when I saw the slides, so I think I'm okay. <laughs> but with that said, I will be short and sweet because I think Carrie, everything Carrie said um, pretty much hit on the points that I wanted to say. I just wanted to add, and thought it was very eloquent, and I would echo everything she said. Um, and then the only thing I will add is that I heard you clarify um, in the scarcity pricing portion that we talked about today that the elements in there really, that they're not scarcity pricing, right? Trying to incentivize behaviors, almost kind of suppress, you know, trying to incentivize behavior, uh, people to participate a day ahead. It's, it's trying to address a, um, a contingency reserve component that might have some pricing relative to what, you know, which I'm not sure that's scarcity pricing um, to try and value some of the out-of-market actions that may be occurring, um, but it could be. So we're thinking about, but I, I it, even if you could argue it's scarcity, I'm not sure it reaches um, enough to be anything more than, as you said, scarcity light. And I'd add my own disclaimer, if even that. Um, but so what was, I would say that from our perspective, from this perspective, what was noticed in, by the CAISO in the past that the scarcity pricing enhancements, really the long-term scarcity pricing enhancements and the system market power mitigation projects would be pursued um, together and, and be implemented in a similar timeline. And that's something that we still think is a commitment from the CAISO and see that being that this proposal here kind of breaks that down. And so I just would ask that if, if that really is the intent to remove that prior commitment, if the CAISO explicitly say that and um, update that prior notice to make that clear that you no longer see the two things as needing to be connected. All right, thanks, thanks Kathleen. Uh, Christina, you know, was, was there anyone else? Oh, you wanted to, we can move on, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, this is James Friedrich again. So in this section, I'll be presenting on other items we're considering for this initiative. 
I'll also go over the California ISO's response to a few um, stakeholder or pieces of stakeholder feedback that we received on the January 6th scoping call for this initiative. And finally, we'll go over the proposed EIM governing body role for each topic. Next slide, please. So there are three, um, we'll call them miscellaneous items. Whoops, back one slide, please. There we go. I'll call them miscellaneous items that we're considering for this initiative. The first is a new OASIS report showing gross exports and imports by Intertie. This is something we are uh, committed to doing, and I believe work is already underway to make this happen. The second item um, are enhancements to the independent study interconnection, which I'll go over in the following slide. And the third item are potential changes to RAIN, the resource adequacy, availability, incentive mechanism. We're still evaluating the feasibility of these frame changes, but I'll also present these changes in more detail in an upcoming slide. Next slide, please. So this slide presents our proposed enhancements to the inter independent study interconnection process. The independent study process allows customers to interconnect to the California ISO grid faster than the cluster study process does. Under this initiative, we are proposing two enhancements. First is to remove the 100 megawatt and 125% cap on behind the meter expansion requests. Second is to enable the ISO to award available deliverability temporarily to online projects until earlier queued projects come online. We believe these enhancements are reasonable steps we could take to provide additional capacity for summer 2021 and allow load serving entities to procure more available RA capacity. Next slide. This slide presents some potential changes to RAIN that may be useful for summer 2021 readiness. Like I said, we're still evaluating the implementation feasibility of these changes. But the items we are considering are, one, to change the availability assessment hours to include weekends and holidays, two, to increase the rain penalty, three, to eliminate certain rain exemptions, for example, for resources less than one megawatt, four, to review outage substitution rules to potentially allow for more flexibility, for example, between imports and internal resources, and or publishing a list of resources that have available non-RA capacity to make it easier for scheduling coordinators to find substitution. And I'll note that uh, planned outage substitution rules is one of the uh, topics being addressed in the RA enhancements initiative that is being accelerated for summer 2021. Um, now, we are soliciting stakeholder feedback on your level of support for these changes. We also realize these changes would be implemented in the middle of an RA operational year. And so we're seeking feedback on whether these changes would cause any contractual issues that um, make it not a good idea to do for the summer. Next slide, please. Now for stakeholder feedback, I'd like to thank entities who took the time to provide feedback to our January 6th scoping call. Uh, I we listed a few comments to respond to. I do not, or I do want to point out that we did not, or we did get a lot of comments about specific scope items that we did not list here, but want to let you know that these comments were considered when developing the policy and scope of this initiative. The nature of the comments we listed here are either <clears throat> general questions that were repeated across many entities or were specific suggestions of things uh, outside of the presented scope on January 6th that stakeholders felt we should consider in this initiative. Uh, so the first, we had a lot of comments about uh, CAISO needing to clarify the permanent, permanent or temporary nature of proposed changes and some calls to uh, have the ISO propose sunset dates for these, uh, some changes here. Uh, currently, we're not proposing sunset dates uh, because the elements of this proposal that could potentially warrant temporary use will only be effect under narrow circumstances. We also note that some proposed changes could eventually be superseded by more comprehensive initiatives, uh, one example of which could be a scarcity pricing enhancements 
initiative that's on our roadmap. Uh, a couple of um, a couple of uh, suggestions for things that we should uh, include in the scope. One is to uh, allow an LLC's unused uh, maximum import capability to be used by another LLC. Um, we did not think that was feasible to be implemented by summer 2021, but uh, we can uh, that can certainly be addressed in an upcoming uh, stakeholder initiative starting in February related to uh, maximum import capability. So that would be a good place to bring that up. Um, the uh, OASIS report um, I talked about that that has been added. Same with suggestions from stakeholders that we modify the frame penalty hours and penalty prices. That's also uh, something that we need to or we're considering. Uh, a comment about su suggesting the ISO accelerate implementation to allow hybrid resources to provide ancillary services. Um, also something we didn't think was feasible to do by summer 2021 and uh, would not add additional capacity to the system. And that's really what we were uh, focused on doing. Next slide, please. Uh, a stakeholder comment asking for the ISO to include evaluation of our emergency operating procedures as part of the scope. Uh, we do anticipate that when our export priorities are finalized that uh, corresponding changes to operator emergency procedures will be made. Uh, a suggestion that the ISO should move forward with immediate enhancements to the resource efficiency evaluation as suggested, suggested in the resource efficiency evaluation workshop. Um, we think that the, uh, the items that we presented today are the ones that are feasible by summer 2021 um, and that we will consider whether to add more comprehensive resource efficiency evaluation review initiative to our policy roadmap to re-examine the core RSC principles. Um, and then finally, a suggestion that we accelerate implementation of additional items outside of uh, the minimum charge requirement and the uh, planned outage substitution that are already being uh, accelerated for summer 2021. Uh, so two examples are uh, related to source identification and attestation and data head tagging requirements. Uh, we're looking into these, uh, the feasibility of accelerating these uh, timelines, but uh, since we got the comments rather recently, we don't, I don't have any more updates other than that, other than we're looking into that. Next slide, please. So finally, this slide lists the proposed EIM governing body classifications for each topic. I'll go through each one and briefly provide our rationale. For the resource sufficiency, for resource sufficiency changes, we propose it to be the primary authority of the EIM governing body because the resource sufficiency evaluation roles are specific to the EIM. For the scarcity pricing changes, we propose an advisory role for the EIM governing body because the changes are generally applicable to the entire real-time market. For both load and export priorities and also for the import and export bidding incentives topic, uh, we propose no role for the EIM governing body because the rules at issue are gener not generally applicable to the entire real-time market. Uh, for RDRR, we propose no role for the EIM governing body because the changes do not affect real-time market rules, just California emergency demand response programs as they relate to California ISO resource adequacy rules. And for storage, we also propose no role for the EIM governing body because the changes only concern uh, California ISO resource adequacy rules. And then finally, for the other topics, again, no role as those are uh, just changes to California ISO interconnection uh, and other uh, ISO resource adequacy topics. That was the last slide. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and just go through the next steps um, real quick. I just want to go through the schedule. I know some of you have to drop off. Uh, again, we are going to host another call. Um, we understand there's a lot to cover today, and you still have some questions, so we will look for some time on Friday morning, um, set up a call. I will uh, issue a notice with the details of that call, so look for that um, fairly soon. Um, so looking at the schedule, we are going to adhere to the February 3rd comment deadline because uh, we are this initiative is on a fast track, um, but the schedule kind of shows the, the, the dates that we 
have planned out. Um, again, these are, you know, they are marked as tentative, and once we have the details, we'll definitely issue a notice with that. So we did, we did publish a, a comments template out on the initial webpage, um, so please use that template when submitting your comments for um, the straw proposal. So let, let's, uh, how many questions do we have in the queue, Chris? Maybe we can take a couple questions, um, and then we'll let everybody go for the day. So I currently have five callers in queue. All right, we'll answer first caller. Hi, caller, you're right now unmuted. Hi there, this is Ray Ann Quadro on behalf of EDF Renewables. I'm wondering if we could take this minute to talk about the ISP enhancements. Um, I have two pretty direct questions. The first one is the deliverability consideration. Can you talk about how that is distinct from the existing interim deliverability status? Um, are you talking about a finding it earlier in the process or because right now generators can come online and if there is deliverability available, they can get ideas assigned on a monthly basis. This is this is James, our uh, uh, subject yeah, matter expert there. on. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, hey Bill, sorry, I didn't know you were there. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to see if you were going to go first. Um, hey, Rayanne, so um, y yes and no. Um, this is sort of temporary interim deliverability. Independent study projects are not eligible for interim deliverability until they've been in the deliverability assessment that they would have been in for if they had been a Q cluster project, so not for, you know, a year later. And that's what we're proposing here is that if we have – temporary deliverability available immediately as soon as they reach online, that we can just award it to them ahead of that tariff contemplated deliverability assessment. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I understand the tariff limitations of the um, IST process and the deliverability, but it doesn't seem like it's uh, distinct from an implementation standpoint, and that's okay. Um, my other question is, are the ISP process, is there any consideration of loosening up the independent requirement of that process? Because if it's, um, it's generally just to prove they're electrically independent to get into it, I'm not sure how many folks are really going to be able to exercise this option and, and bring their supply online ASAP. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, at this time, there's not. It, it's really hard to get around the independence test because otherwise you're, you know, sort of jumping the queue for projects that have been submitted in the cluster process. Um, but both of these, both of these enhancements are designed for, you know, projects that are, are in queue, that are in the pipeline, that can help us this summer. Um, so hopefully, you know, they they really will bear some fruit. But you know. I, I understand your question. I'll take it back to the team. Oh, I, did, I just was looking for the clarification, frankly. I don't think I uh, disagree with the underlying wisdom there. I just wanted to kind of get that on the record. So I appreciate that. Yeah, understood. Okay, Chris, how many others in the queue? We have time I have, for one. Uh, four more callers in the queue. Okay. Hi, we'll answer next caller. Hi, caller. Your line is now unmuted. Hey, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. A uh, couple quick questions and comments. Um, one, just logistics. Are you looking for us to submit written comments ahead of Friday to help guide that meeting, or are we just going to have kind of open mic time? Yeah, this is Brad. Uh, the idea is, uh, you know, we realize that, we have a lot of material here, and, and we rushed through it, and, and we didn't get it posted till late. So uh, the idea is just to provide a, a chance for additional questions um, before comments are due, since they're due fairly quickly. They're due uh, Tuesday, isn't it, Christina? When, uh, Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday. Oh, okay, Wednesday. Yeah. So we just we just wanted to allow a chance for more discussion and as you think about the stuff, ask, ask uh, questions as you're formulating your comments. Okay, great. And then uh, two other comments. One would just be that the request that the Kaiser just take these slides and put them into a narrative format, um, not to increase the length per se, but just to make sure that 
we aren't filling in words that you don't intend um, when sort of translating from the shorthand that's used in PowerPoint to uh, thinking about a, a more complete thought. I know you can't do a, a full written straw proposal, but um, some form of this in a in a narrative would be great. And the uh, other question or point is just to request that you know, any data that you have around sort of the defense for moving forward with SMPM um, that that was mentioned, that, that gets brought to a, an actual stakeholder meeting, um, hopefully well in advance of, of, I think the MSC meeting is, is February 11th. Um, it just doesn't seem like the timing is right with that MSC meeting, nor that the MSC meeting is, is an appropriate place to be having, um, you know, sort of stakeholder uh, policy discussions um, since, you know, not all the stakeholders who are involved in, in this meeting are attending the MSC calls. So uh, just a comment, and I'll leave it there. Okay. Yeah, we can consider that. As far as a narrative, you know, like when we uh, kicked off this initiative, we have to move pretty fast, and, um, you know, I, I don't know that we have the bandwidth to do a narrative. Uh, you know, we were hard-pressed to work out these approaches and get these uh, slides posted. You know, a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of interactions that it gets complicated, but I do realize that there are a number of, of details that aren't on these slides that we will flesh out. Um, you know, the original plan was to flesh those out in a uh, Business requirements, and uh, uh, we can we can look at the timing of that and see how that works, and or um, 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 uh, think of some other kind of uh, supplemental information we can release in conjunction with these slides. Okay, and and definitely appreciate having the call on Friday too. So that should help give us some more time to just ask any clarifying questions on what you meant with some of the words on the slide. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. So Chris, how many more do we have in the queue? I know we have I a have, card cut off at 4.30, right? I have three more calls in queue, yes. All right, move down to our next caller. Hi, right, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, it's Marco Telpine again. Brad, I want to follow up on what you just said. You know, there's lots of interactions in this, and it gets really complicated, and the ISO has, only has a certain amount of bandwidth. Um, so, you know, when we put in comments, um, are you going to ask – you haven't yet, but I guess I'm suggesting – are you going to ask for prioritization? Um, because you can't do all this. I mean, you keep saying throughout the presentation, we don't even know if it's feasible. We don't have enough time to do it. We haven't analyzed the unintended consequences. Um, so, do you want us to prioritize these changes for you, in our views? Yeah, Mark, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, please do. Okay, and I, I will tell you that, that things like RAIN changes are so cryptic that they don't really allow us to provide some stiff, com you know, comment, I don't think. We don't know what price level you're talking about. We don't know what hours you're talking about. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to provide anything that's probably useful to you. Um, but then finally, I just have a technical question. It, you've been pretty clear that the, the pseudo-scarcity pricing mechanism you're going to put and system market power you're targeting August 1st, is all the rest of this stuff intended to go in in June before the summer? Yes. Or does, does it all happen August 1st in a big bang? No, no, the, 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 rest, the, the rest of the stuff would be uh, uh, June. Okay, so you're targeting June 1st for, for instance, this rain change, the RDRR, all those other items. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chris, we'll go to the next caller. I know we have two in the queue, so we have a, a hard cut off at 4.30. We could probably take those questions. All right, moving on to our next caller. Hi, caller, your line is now unmuted. Hi, it's Mary Lynch with Constellation. Christina, you already answered my question in the chat, so I'm good. Great, thanks, Mary. Okay, one more in the queue. All right, we're on to our last caller. Hi, caller, your line is now unmuted. 
Hey, good afternoon. It's Mark Simons at Bonneville. I think uh, Mark's last point is a good one on prioritization. We're already moving in that direction. And I think as we pointed out earlier, changes to the resource efficiency test are a really high priority for us, higher than, for example, implementing SMPM that, you know, the DMM has gone on to indicate was, uh, as Carrie said, um, not found to be an issue, and even as you said, Perry, high prices were set by demand response and other resources. On that point, also want to say that the governing body role is not identified for the system market power. If you all could do that for us, that would be very helpful. Yeah, that would be uh, advisory role for the EM governing body. Yes. Sorry for that omission. We'd, we'd already talked about that in the, the system market power mitigation initiative. Yeah, we, we have it listed as advisory in the in the latest uh, proposal for system market power mitigation. And as you know, that's been a bit of an issue. So um, appreciate the comments on it. Uh, lots of information here. Look forward to further discussion on Friday. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I believe that's it in the queue, Chris, correct? That is correct. I have no more callers in queue. Okay, thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Um, I will try and get that notice out uh, tomorrow so that, um, you know, with the, the call details for Friday uh, so that you can get that added to your calendar. So I uh, really appreciate the discussion today and your participation, and hope you have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Hi, right, that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.